other commitments as a committee this morning. We sent a invite to the portfolio committee on women, um, youth and persons with disabilities, uh, as well as an invite to the multi-party caucus, women's caucus, um, and to uh, Honorable Sylvia Lucas as well. So we did receive some of those apologies, but I'd like to then maybe um, besides the members from the Committee on Higher Education, uh, Science and Innovation, see if there are any members from other portfolio committees who are in the meeting, so that we just acknowledge their presence. I see Honorable Nkomo is here, if she uh, wants to just greet. Um, and then, I don't know, other members um, from, I think... Uh, uh, Recording in progress. Can, but let me just uh, afford an opportunity for members to just open their mics um, and then introduce themselves if there are members from other committees who are present. Morning, Chair. Uh, but I am driving. I'll be a little bit disturbed. Thanks. Okay, um, that's Honorable Sibia from the Portfolio Committee on Higher Education, Science and Innovation. Can I note any other members from other committees who are present? Okay. All right, well, we'll note the presence of members perhaps when we go into discussions. I think we can start our meeting with the first presentation of the day. I'd like to welcome all colleagues from the different entities that will be presenting to us this morning. We will firstly have the National Advisory Council on Innovation, which is a DSI entity that will be presenting on women participation in science, uh, technology, and innovation. Um, we'll then have the Academy of Science of South Africa, ASAF, um, that will be presenting on women in STEM. And Shanaz, if you could just kindly, I don't know if I've maybe missed the apology, um, the written apology by Prof Janssen, given reasoning as to why he won't be here, and then indicating who will be leading the delegation. I see um, the Vice President, uh, Professor Burton, is on the platform. Um, and also just, I, I, don't, I don't know, but Shanaz, you'll help me to recall, this may be the second meeting that we've had that um, the, the president has not been able to attend of the committee. And you'll just help me to go through those records, Shanaz. Um, we'll then have uh, the CGE also then presenting to us, uh, led by the CEO um, and the acting chairperson, the CEO, Ms. Nkomo, as well as the chairperson, uh, Ms. Mazibugo. Welcome to all colleagues. We look forward to your presentations with great interest. Um, the committee, um, no, well, many may, may be aware that the committee takes, takes great interest in terms of representation, uh, inclusivity, intersectionality. Um, and so particularly in the sciences, colleagues would be aware that our conversation um, has always been that we are well aware of the fact that the Department of Science and Innovation and its entities are you know, really performing well. When you look at the audit outcomes each year, um, their ability to meet their targets, um, their ability to 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 account on, on on their finances and to spend their finances adequately. However, we've always raised the concern around impact um, and whether or not the the, the great uh, audit outcomes translate to uh, greater lived realities for for women through the inclusion of women in science and innovation to ensure that science and innovation in society uh, is able to respond to the needs of, of women, uh, uh, you know, uh, the black community, the vulnerable uh, people of the proletariat, um, people living with disabilities, um, uh, you know, and previously uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, with the CGE, of course, we've always taken great interest as well there on, um, you know, the, the, the state of women and gender 
uh, realities within higher education and we've interacted on multiple occasions. Um, we have as a committee advanced some of the recommendations that you have come with um, through the investigations that you do in our conversations and deliberations with the department, be it at the TVET uh, industry partnership uh, summit that they had to say, where do we then find uh, the inclusion of women, of young women in the TVET sector in industry um, through, of course, ensuring that there's enough representation of lecturers, ensuring that we have policies put in place to protect women um, uh, who are both students and uh, academics in the space. We have a challenge um, CEO where they, they really is a poor representation of women in the leadership of our institutions of higher learning, but well, both the university program and the TVET program. Um, I don't know who, who's here from the department, um, but they would give us the number of principals in the TVET colleges that are women, and it is not even, uh, it's way far from being 50%. So those are some of the concerns that we have, of course, um, but we have as a committee uh, taken your recommendations as the CGE from the previous discussions that we've had and continued to use them to hold the department to account uh, and try our best to monitor the implementation of those recommendations. So um, we've also in the past, of course, encouraged for greater um, uh, partnership and relation between or cooperation between the department and the CGE. It can't be that uh, the CGE is doing work or there are outcomes uh, through the investigations, observations and recommendations that the department is not aware of. It can't be that um, the CGE is doing work and the department is not aware of that. Um, so we've, we've called for greater synergy and we hope that as you report to us today, um, you will be able to share some of the strides you have been able to make in terms of your rela working relationship with the Department of Higher Education and Training. Um, but yeah, colleagues, so today we'll, we'll, we'll be dealing with both um, the sciences uh, and, and higher education, which is testament to the fact that we want to strengthen the higher education, science, technology, and innovation landscape. Recording stopped. That these two spaces can coexist. Um, I'd like to then hand over to the colleagues from NACI, um, who will make the first presentation this morning. We'll take, I think we should be able to take all three presentations and go into questions and discussions. Um, each, each entity has 30 minutes to present to us. I think as the CGE has been given an additional 10 minutes. So we'll take all three presentations uh, and then members will um we'll, we'll engage and then we'll take uh, question uh, responses and um, from those responses what you cannot uh, respond to today you can do so in writing recording in progress um so yeah i think that's it from my mm. side now let me then hand over to the acting ceo of um of NACI, uh, Dr. Mlumi Sitele. I see someone else's mic is open. I don't know if that means that Mr. Tele is not available, but Lichani, Tina Lichani, if you can switch off your mic, please. But I think I'm seeing, oh, that's the device you're using, Mr. Tele. Okay, all right, there we go. Over to you, colleagues. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Good morning to you and to honorable members of the Portfolio Committee. We are the delegation from the National Advisory Council on Innovation. And we thank the committee for the invitation to appraise the committee of the, of, about the important work that NACI has done on women participation in science, technology, and innovation. My name is Lindy Wezungu. I'm the council member, the new council member at NACI, and I'm representing our chairperson of the council, Mr. T. Manyoni, who could not join us this morning due to other commitments. So he delegated me to come and represent him on his behalf. I'm happy to announce that I'm accompanied by the acting CEO, Dr. Mlungi Sitele and Ms. Tandogazi Teti, who is one of our rising and shining stars who's going to do the presentation. 
Honorable Chairperson, please allow me to indicate or to declare that as the new council, we have begun our, our work to provide oversight to NACI to make sure that the mandate is fully implemented and realized. We met for the first time yesterday just to map the way forward and come up with a structure that's going to be implemented during our four year term to make sure that we fulfill our mandate to um, the maximum. And i um, like to put a comment that through our chairperson, um, as a new council members, we are very committed to make sure that we drive the transformation agenda with a view to promote a full participation of women in science, technology, and innovation. In, one of, in our meeting yesterday, the transformation agenda in the national um, um, science, technology, and innovation was one of the items that was robustly discussed. And we are mapping initiatives to make sure that comes to a fruition. And I would also like to thank the outgoing council members for the work that they have done because today's presentation is based on the baseline work that was done during their term. And on that note, Honorable Chairperson, please allow me to hand over to the acting CEO to do the presentation. Thank you. Uh, good morning, the Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members. Uh, and um, uh, Professor Zungu, uh, who is representing our chairperson. Uh, chair, the council took a decision a uh, few years ago to establish a transformation program for the National System of Innovation, giving our mandate to provide advice to government on any matters related to STI. And as Professor Zunga indicated, that uh, transformation is, agenda is now a standing item uh, on our work. We've set out to uh, bring together different stakeholders to help us evolve uh, such a program, uh, which is currently underway. And shortly we would, we would expand on, what, on the key elements of that, uh, of that program. But it's essential to emphasize that we are working with as many uh, people as possible uh, who have interest in the area. Of course, our work uh, considers the context, both domestic and international context in which uh, we do find ourselves, uh, which is characterized by a range of uh, uh, transitions, whether in terms of environmental and sustainability, but we also recognize um, the challenges that our society and the world is confronted with, uh, which include amongst others, the social reproduction crisis, which is at the heart of today's uh, discussion, uh, which we're very grateful to uh, the portfolio committee for having uh, thought and convinced all of us to contribute. Of course, we also recognize uh, other developments at a global level, which has an impact in the way we think about uh, the question of transformation, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the National Strategic Plan on Gender-Based Violence and Femicide, and the whole need uh, to reflect uh, and transform knowledge production relations uh, as they impact on the various elements uh, which are important to our transformation program. And of course, the new production revolution, or what some would tend to refer to as the fourth industrial revolution or fifth industrial revolution, and the impact of such uh, on, on especially historically disadvantaged uh, communities and groupings. And then most importantly, we wanted to make sure that we are able to track progress that the, the National System of Innovation is making regarding uh, the NDP 2030 targets, which our presentation will also touch. Uh, finally, Chairperson, uh, of course, Nick, even though it's an advisory body, but we do have an interest in influencing uh, fundamental change in our society. And we would like to make sure that through our work, we are able to provide uh, evidence-informed 
uh, advice on the extent to which the national system of innovation is able or is not able to influence. Uh, I would like to then uh, ask my colleague, uh, Tandogazi, who chairperson has been at the forefront uh, of conceptualizing and doing the analysis and, and putting together the report, uh, which we are pleased to share with members of uh, the portfolio committee and 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 others and other participants. Tandogazi, go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity, honourable chair and honourable members, uh, to present to the portfolio committee today. Um, the work that we are doing is on the participation of women in science and technology. Uh, and innovation, but we focused on uh, STEM education, which is science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics. And the key message that we would like to show is the face of the STEM uh, field. And um, I want to put it up front that uh, the work that we've done, as in the report and this presentation, it gives statistical um, representation. It doesn't go into the details of why the numbers are looking like this. Hopefully the next uh, report will go deeper and look further. My presentation outlined today, it will touch briefly on the background and we speak about the methodology, the findings, and then we conclude. In terms of the background, this work is, work that was done by a NACI standing committee that was called the Set for Women. And another name that was given to it was the South African Research Group uh, a Committee. And this committee was uh, uh, launched in 2003 by the then Minister, uh, Honorable Minister uh, um, Sonjika. And when she, the, it was um, launched, it was meant to implement the national uh, R&D strategy that was in place in 2002. Uh, so the work that they were doing was mainly in producing mechanisms that can uh, monitor women participation and increase participation of women in the STEM fields. It also was uh, as saying monitoring where women are. And this work gave birth to the Facing the Facts report. And this report, uh, the first one was produced in 2004 and the second one in 2009. In 2019, not in 2019, in 2020, we wanted to look at the progress that was made in the, that was made in the decade. That is why we the report that we have, it's saying 2019. And that report is the third iteration. As Dr. Kelle has indicated that Nike has a strategic uh, program on transformation and this program reintroduced the Facing the Facts report, uh, which we produced uh, last Sorry, year. Please. I just, I, I was trying to wait for the presentation to go into full presentation mode, but I don't think it's done so, or on my side, definitely not. Um, so we're seeing, it's not on presentation mode. Um, okay, we'll try and put it on presentation mode. Yes, right. Apologies, Chair. We're just trying to get there. No worries. Yeah, just press, just press that swap uh, thing where you were. 
Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Honorable. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. We apologize for that. Um, as I was saying that the transformation program is important in Naki and uh, part of the reason uh, uh, that the, the, um, the program was introduced, it came after the 2019 uh, White Paper on Science and Technology, which was emphasizing the issues of inclusivity, inclusivity and, and transformation. So the program is uh, reintroducing the Facing the Facts report, as I said, and it is uh, embedded on the development of measurement indicators. And it has three uh, pro, uh, pillars. One pillar is on strengthening human capital, and we know how important human capital is in the issues of transformation. It's also about strengthening economic uh, uh, transformation and also strengthening um, the institutions of the NSI. Is it more? The methodology, I will speak about the methodology. In terms of the methodology, um, I want to say upfront that the report was based on the previous work that was done. So we focus on the indicators that were in the previous report. And the previous report obviously was using a quantitative framework, a research framework, and the indicators that it selected were mainly from the higher education institution, but even in the higher education institution, it didn't include the TVET sector and, and the basic education in terms of the education sector. So this is part of the limitation of the report. And also because it's quantitative data in nature, therefore a quantitative data does not necessarily sometimes give you the reason why the data is moving that. So it doesn't give us that in-depth information. So the select, selected indicators, as I indicated, were in the previous report, and they were mainly in the area of student enrollment and graduation. And that was a uh, DHET data. It was on human resource um, set. That was the R&D data, the publication outputs. That was also the DHET data. Funding allocation uh, and scientific rating was NRF related data. So I would like to thank the colleagues that we worked with also in this to produce this report because they assisted. This report was then validated and verified with the institutions that uh, I mentioned and the institutions, it was also workshopped with the stakeholder in the NSI. We received inputs in terms of how to uh, broaden and strengthen the report and those inputs will be taken into consideration as the, uh, the future reports, sorry. The findings, in terms of the findings, I will start with the National Development Plan targets. And the two targets that you will see are the targets that are aligned to the indicators that were in the report. So the, there is a target in terms of enrollment at postgraduate level in, in the NDP, and it's hoping that we can have 25% of uh, enrollment at higher at uh, postgraduate level. So we then link it and like and try to look in terms of set enrollment. And what we saw is that in terms of set enrollment at postgraduate level, in 2009, it was 85 to 15. 15% at postgraduate level. There was a 3% increase uh, in terms of the 10 decade. And when we look at that, we think that if we maintain and double the, the, the growth, we will be able to meet that target. In terms of academic staff, there is also a target that is put by the NDP. The target is mainly about making sure that the, we increase the PhD staff with uh, doctoral degrees from 34% up to 75%. And we are currently standing at 49%. And I think more work needs to be done in this area. And you will see when we speak uh, about academic staff and the face of the academic staff, you will see the number of academic staff are found where and why we are having challenges. When we look at set enrollment and graduation by gender, we see that there is an increase from women representation in, 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 in set 
uh, and in graduation, you will see females increased from 45 to 49% uh, in 2020. And we see in graduation, females increased from 49 to 53% in graduation. So they are currently a majority in terms of those that are graduating. However, they are in minority in terms of those that are enrolling. And this, unfortunately, is a change uh, from the previous report that showed that women were in majority in enrollment. So we still need to do more. In terms of set enrollment and graduation by race, uh, we see that in, in terms of enrollment, Africans are in a majority. There is an increase from 63 to 75%. They are followed by white uh, race, which is they were at 24 and there's a decrease that is uh, seen to 19%. We also are interested to see in terms of yeah, the graduation, because the previous report indicated that even though they were graduating, they were and enrolling, they were in minority in terms of um, the higher postgraduate level. So we tried to also observe and see in terms of the report, in terms of what is happening. In enrollment, you see that um, women are in majority in terms of postgraduate level. Uh, the lower postgraduate levels. And then in terms of masters, the 2009, they were in minority, now they are in majority. So we are seeing improvement at postgraduate level, although they are still in minority in terms of doctoral level. It's a similar picture when it comes to representation in terms of graduation. Um, we then looked at the fields of study. It is important to check the fields of study purely because if you look at the field of study, we find that women are in majority in health sciences, life sciences, and social sciences, and are in minority when it comes to mathematics, engineering, and computer sciences. So, but we see that now they have uh, began to be in majority in terms of the agriculture and, res and, and renewable resources. The importance of computer science and engineering and mathematics in terms of making that, that we have equity in those areas is because the majority of our future jobs are in those, uh, demand those fields. So we need to improve in terms of the representation of women in those areas. Similarly, in graduation, the picture is the same. We see an improvement in terms of agriculture and renewable resources in terms of uh, graduates. And we see that the computer sciences and data processing, we still having women in minority in terms of graduation. Uh, then we are leaving now the the higher education sector, and we are trying to go and see the researchers in employment. Now, the face, if you saw that the face of, 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 of the higher education is women and, and Africans. Now, we begin to see that in employment, that this is a different uh, picture. Women are in minority in, 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 in so researchers or research R&D development. The women are in minority at 48%, and even though we see improvements in terms of representation. In terms of racial representation, we also see that white men are in majority and they are followed by Africans. This is important as we go, you will see we move to higher education. Uh, in terms of higher education, you will see that my, women are in majority. Uh, but there was uh, they before in 2019 they were in minority in professional staff, but now they've reached parity. But it is important if you go down to the professional staff and look at women, you will find now that the academic males are in majority versus women in being in majority. That's just drilling down into the data. There is also an important thing that one needs to do, especially when you're trying to follow with the NDP, you see that lecturers are the majority of uh, the academic staff. And you are going to see as we move, uh, so here, let me start here, we see that uh, the 
age of academic staff. This is important because we need to measure more than just gender and race. We need to start looking at the uh, youth and the the ages of our academic staff as the NRD strategy indicated that they were aging. We see a picture that is important here that where women decreases as their age decrease, increases, but men's age increases as the age increases. And we need to do a more uh, investigation to understand, is it because it's a leaky pipeline issue? Why are women reducing as they get older? So this is the slide that I wanted to link with the slide about uh, academic staff being in um, majority at the lecture rank. We see that in majority at lecture rank, the 23%, I'm so sorry, I can't see there, 23% of uh, uh, doctoral uh, uh, of lecturer have uh, a PhD. So the majority of the, of the lecturers do not have a PhD, they have a master's level. Uh, uh, education. We also see here, if you look at the numbers in terms of professors, women are almost half of the professors there. And the, that is the majority of people that have the PhD. And you look at the lecturer, women are in majority in terms of, uh, of lecturers. So in, if we want to improve the, 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 the area of uh, uh, doctorates in South Africa, especially with academic staff, one needs to focus in the areas of lectures and below lecturers. And it's important to understand that in these areas, the uh, academic staff have to do a lot of teaching more than research. And so we need to also do a lot of work in that area. We then now leave the, uh, the academic staff and we look at their publications in terms of publication. We see the publication that in terms of race, you're of gender, uh, men are in majority in terms of publication. In 2020, women were publishing at 37%, and that's still in minority. And we see that general publication by a, a race that white uh, are uh, publishing more than the other race, and they are followed by Black Africans. But we also see in the study that the race, the different races, either than the whites, have had an increase in terms of uh, representation. Uh, the publication and the rating systems are linked with the NRF. And then we went to see, in terms of the NRF, what is the demographic of the NRF? And we see that the NRF researchers mainly are men and at 64%. And we also see that in terms of race, the NRF rated researchers are white and they are followed by blacks and non-South uh, Africans. We were interested to find in terms of researchers, where is the biggest research happening within the NRF? We saw that natural sciences, are the, uh, uh, that is where the majority of our research, uh, are rated researchers are sitting. So the key message that we want to, to, to give is that when we looked into the participation of women, we see there is progress, but uh, the improvements that are there are not necessarily, uh, we have not necessarily reached what we want to, to, to reach. Uh, we see that Africans and women are in majority in education where it comes to enrollment and, and, and graduation, but we go to employment, we see that our publications are white and men, we see that the NRF rating is white and men, we see that our researchers are white and men. So we still have a lot of things that we would need to do to improve uh, the participation of women in the STEM fields. What another challenge that we had was segregation of data. We are unable to see the, the age in terms of the available data. We are not able to see the disability in terms of the publicly available data. We also would like to see the, the different the spatial representation, whether it's urban or rural. We will also want to see more in terms of 
what is needed in, in, in disaggregating our data. And with that, I would say thank you. Thank you um, uh, for the presentation. Um, and I would like now to hand over to the Honorable Chair after our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues, for that presentation. I would like to now hand over to Asaf, um, and they would be handing over to Prof Burton. Good morning. Good morning, Honorable Chairperson and uh, Honorable Members of the Committee. Uh, I'd like to start by saying thank you to the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee on Higher Education, Science and Technology for this is an opportunity uh, for us as the Academy of Sciences of South Africa to present to you. Um, I'm Stephanie Burton. I'm the Vice President of the Academy and I am here on behalf of the Academy of Science representing our, our President, Professor Jonathan Jansen. I am joined today also by my colleague, um, Professor Sabia Essek, who is the other Vice President of the Academy, and she will be uh, participating later uh, in some of the discussion and the questions. I'm also uh, joined here today by Dr. Himla Sudial, who is our Executive Officer, and then we also have some members of the ASAF Council and Senior Administrative Staff. Chair, I just reiterate that our mandate as the Academy of Sciences of South Africa is to offer evidence-based science advice to government and to other stakeholders. And we aspire to be a leading organization for science and scholarship. Um, and, our, and all of our strategy and policies and activities demonstrate that. Today, our presentation focuses on the Academy, the activities of the Academy, in relation to women in science, technology, engineering, and maths, STEM. Um, and we're going to be very pleased to show you a number of activities that ASAP supports and implements, and that are making some significant impact nationally in support of women in science, and addressing some of the challenges in developing gender inclusivity and equity. Much of what we do in relation to women in science involves partnerships with a range of partners, including national research agencies and government departments, as well as international organizations and networks. And we're very proud that a number of women science leaders in this country are members of the Academy, and many of them are serving on important standing committees and review panels uh, of the Academy. We also seek to support the development of women in our National Young Academy of Science, and to enable emerging women scientists to benefit from our networks in becoming leaders on national and global platforms. And I heard very clearly the data from our colleague from NACI about the fact that the, the opportunity for us is in fact to develop early career um, emerging scientists uh, in, in that rank at universities of, of lecturer and thereabouts. So Chair, that's a very brief comment. I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Himla Sudial. She will begin the presentation on the activities of ASAP in the context of women in science. And she will introduce the two speakers we have who are also going to share in that presentation. When it comes to the discussion, Professor Sabia Essek will also be participating. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Burton, uh, Chairperson, members of the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee, and other colleagues. Uh, greetings to you all. And uh, yes, we live in a world of load shedding and other challenges. So uh, sorry to those people who are going through that. I've had to move venue to be able to be in a place to have uh, power this morning. Chairperson, firstly, I want to again tender the apologies of Professor Jonathan Janssen. Um, he, at the last minute last week, had made himself available, but given the last minute change to the meeting this week, unfortunately, he was not able to attend, as were some of our other council members who had indicated their availability last week, but unfortunately, this week, uh, we're not able to attend. So I also wish to tender 
apologies from the other council members. And thank you to Professor Burton and Professor Isak for availing themselves. I know you've had to change your calendar somewhat, uh, so we greatly appreciate your support. Chairperson, the last time we met, um, you had said that you really enjoyed listening to other voices uh, during the presentations. We've taken heed of that. And today I'm pleased to announce that my uh, colleague, Prof. Dr. Malusi Twala, who is the ASAF Manager for Science Advisory Programs and Strategic Partnerships, will be joined by Dr. Caroline Poule, who is a scientist at UCT, but also the chairperson of the EXCO of the Organization of Women in Science for the Developing World, or OATST. Uh, they would uh, present some of the activities that we jointly conduct. And uh, with that chairperson, I now hand over to Dr. Twala to lead us in the presentation. Thank you. And Lucy, over to you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you, Honorable Chair, for the opportunity. Uh, to the Honorable Members as well, uh, greeting to you all and colleagues. I'd just like to quickly share the presentation. I hope you can. Okay. I hope you can see it on your site. Um, colleagues, I'd just like to give an overview of how ASAF is responding to uh, the gender gap that exists within the science and technology and innovation. Sorry, colleagues, can we please uh, put the presentation on presentation mode? I think if you go to the tab that says display settings. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you and apologies for that. I couldn't see on my side. So the, the women in sciences agenda um, at ASAF is uh, driven through the uh, science advisory and strategic partnerships portfolio, which I many times I was uh, requested to just highlight on some of the activities that uh, we uh, drive as the academy, but also that we execute um, with other partners locally as well as uh, internationally in order to close this gap. We are here today because I think it is of the appreciation uh, of the gap that exists with regards to the uh, involvement of women in science, technology, and innovation. Now, the gap is a global uh, phenomenon, uh, which means that uh, country to country, the picture is largely the same, that uh, women lag behind in terms of their involvement, leadership, and so forth in, uh, in STEM and STI. However, in the South African context, um, historically, uh, the participation um, previously within the national uh, system of innovation um, excluded certain uh, races. So even before we come to gender inclusivity, the large population of um, South African women were already excluded. In that context, it almost seems like there's a double barrier that uh, women have to uh, actually overcome for full emancipation within, within the sector. Now, as I've mentioned earlier that this is a global phenomenon and uh, my joint presenter will go into details um, around this, but we just wanted to present um, to this session that uh, this is a global uh, phenomenon and uh, ASAF is uh, executing activities to address this um, as best as we, as we can. Now, I would like to highlight, Chair, um, that um, in ASAP, we do have a transformation strategy, um, which first uh, not only talks to the gender inclusivity matters, but transformation at large. And that also talks to race, um, race um, uh, inclusivity, but also geographical and institutional, um, as well as discipline, science discipline, uh, inclusivity. As a member-based uh, organization, we have observed that membership of the academy does not reflect the spread of the country. So within the, the, the transformation strategy, those are some of the aspects that we are trying to address 
including um, the issues of women in science and technology. Now, whilst we do have uh, transformation as a performance uh, strategic objective within the academy, and um, the lens that we execute on our activities, it is through the lens of inclusivity, not only from a gender perspective, but the others that I have also uh, highlighted. So I just present to you that um, gender inclusivity cuts across all the activities that we execute as the academy. Now, through our mandate of formulating um, uh, STI corporation um, uh, partnerships, uh, this is one aspect that we also execute um, uh, or strengthen gender inclusivity. This is in addition to science advisory mandate that we have. And in that light chair, um, I would like to emphasize that um, our approach to women in science does not only focus um, on women at uh, the higher echelons of education or academia, but we start looking at girl learners at school levels as being the future um, of the women in science. So our activities um, also start at, uh, at a school level. Now, just recently, um, ASAF um, launched the Women in Leadership series. Um, and the previous lab, uh, which was in September 22, which was hosted by our Vice President, uh, Professor Bertin, uh, was in partnership with other local institutions. Now, the scope of this initiative is to showcase, celebrate um, achievements um, by female scientists and, and, and business leaders at national as well as international level. And this is conceptualized just to ensure that um, um, amongst uh, uh, early career women as well as um, uh, uh, school going girls, they can see the leaders that have achieved um, uh, tremendous achievements at a national as well as international um, levels. Now, our focus for this year, Chair, um, into 23, 24 uh, financial year, we would like to launch uh, or deliver this series by focusing on community-based organization, whereby we showcase um, uh, women leaders who, have, um, who are leading uh, community-based um, uh, organizations. Now, we hold the view that working closely with communities, such leaders, a good evidence um, of what um, uh, uh, women leaders can achieve. And our focus in this year is on food security theme, which is among the priority themes of the academy, whereby we hold the view that um, in the South African context, when it comes to food security, it is actually women who carry the large burden of achieving food security in this country. That is if we're to exclude the male dominated commercial agricultural sector. So we are currently formulating partnerships uh, which will see us up and showcase some of these uh, 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 female leaders in community-based organizations. Now through the lens of the district development uh, model, um, ASAP is partnering with the city of Tswane um, to uh, support um, uh, uh, initiatives at school levels, with our priority being uh, innovation or projects that are driven by girl learners. Now, in this instance, what ASA brings to the table is uh, forms of sponsorships uh, for those uh, projects. But through our partnership networks, we seek to connect those projects um, that the girls are leading or the school learners are leading with some partners that can actually expand the life cycle or the value chain of those projects. And we hope that some of them will actually extend to commercialization and hopefully create some job opportunities as we go along the line. Another project that we are pleased to execute on behalf of the Department of Science and Innovation as well as the country is the Lindau Nobel Prize meetings project. Now, this is a project whereby um, ASAP, as well as the Department of Science and Innovation, nominate early career scientists from master's level to postdoctoral level to attend the Lidao Nobel Prize meetings. Now, Chair, I would like to indicate that within the sciences uh, domain, this is at the same level as the Oscars and, 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 and other Nobel uh, Prize awards that we see. 
So it is really a privilege for um, early career scientists to attend these meetings, to see and interact um, with the Nobel Prize winners in their disciplines. And with this, um, the DSI and I think the country as well, we seek to expose these early career scientists to, to such achievers. And psychologically, we hope it will strengthen their confidence to see themselves as being the future leaders. And South Africa currently is the only African participant in this uh, project. And we hope in the future that some of the early career scientists who've attended these meetings will be in the future Nobel laureate winners themselves. And South Africa will get one in the sciences discipline. Now, our nomination with the Department of Science and Innovation always carries the lens of transformation with respect to South Africa. So we try to ensure as much as possible based on the applications that we receive that our nominations to the Bindao Council and, and shows the, the geographical representation of the institutions, of the discipline, science disciplines, but also other transformation imperatives of South Africa. However, it is the Lindau Council that actually endorses um, our, um, our nomination. So we do not always get what we um, you know, nominated, um, but we always, and we are pleased that recently we've been able to get, at least in terms of transformation, good representativity in terms of the delegation of young scientists that attend these meetings. And um, recently there's been good domination by female uh, early career scientists. And we are pleased to see this as the, as the academy. Now, Chair, if you can kindly allow me just in the vein of partnerships to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Caroline Pule, who is from OST, uh, who will be giving a few slides on, uh, OST is one of our partners in, 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 in this gender transformation agenda. And I would like to hand over with your permission, Chair. Thank you. Then I'll return later to finish the presentation. Um, thank you, Dr. Melusi, for giving me the platform. And thank you, Chair. And uh, good morning, everyone. As Dr. Melusi have mentioned, I'm coming in the capacity as um, the chairperson of the national chapter for Organization for Women in Science and for the Developing World. And basically, I'm just going to be touching through on some of the work that we are currently doing and aspiring to do in collaboration with ASAF, which is our host um, science academy within South Africa. So firstly, um, the organization, um, it is an international organization which is highly from uh, Trieste, Italy. Um, and then we have about five regions and 40 national chapters of which South Africa is one of the national chapters within the African region. Um, and the good news is that the vice president for the African region is Professor Babaluala, who is currently based at the University of Northwest. And the president of the, the international organization is Prof, Professor Jennifer Thompson, who's also um, known from her incredible work uh, as a scientist at the University of Cape Town, which shows there is a representation of um, South Africa within the international organization. Um, and then our objective is basically to strengthen the role of women scientists in the development process through their journey of becoming scientists, promoting their representation in scientific and technological leadership so that they can get opportunities for them to lead within the space. And we have um, membership, uh, which we have our full members who would be mostly the scientists who have completed their PhD or obviously finished their master's degree. And then we have affiliate members who would be mostly like some of the young scientists who just finished their honors or other members who are in the, the women in STEM and wanting to join the organization. Uh, but we, the other interesting one, which shows that we're very inclusive, we have friends of OST, which allows men to also be part of our organization, supporting um, women in science and also trying to show that they also are aware of the gender inequality within the space of sciences. 
And um, one of the things that we have, which is our strengths, we have a huge membership, which South African National Chapter has about 505 members of which some of them are temporary and some of them are permanent residents of South Africa as some of our members are not from South Africa, but they are studying within South African institutions. Uh, next slide. Um, Dr. Melusi, can you go to the next slide? Okay. So as um, just going back to the slide that was presented by Dr. Melusi, um, I'm a very passionate medical scientist and I'm all about advocating for women in STEM. And when I saw this incredible work, which was done by Huang et al, I was like shocked to see that actually the gender inequality in science is still huge. Um, as if you look at this graph, just to make you understand, um, this just shows you the numbers statistically, how the gender inequality is within the science space. Um, and this also, if you look at it, it shows that the gender imbalance has been in existence from 1955 until to date, but obviously there has been transformation. And just to make you understand the, the, the light color, which is pink, it represents females and the blue color represent males. So there's a three representations here. The first part, which is A, it showed here, they were showing the number of 80 female and male authors over time, um, based on the research being done in sciences. And if you look at these numbers, there's about 73.2% of males compared to 26.8% 26 of female, which shows there is a huge gender gap. And this is uh, through evolving throughout the years that this has been, um, you know, like the gender equality has, has been there from the beginning when I was not even born, there was still this gender inequality. Um, and then again, on B, they were also trying to show actually what about the different disciplines? And then again, you can see that there was that huge gap where high males are the ones that are doing research compared to females uh, with the low numbers. And then the third one, which is more relevant to this meeting, showing countries. And if you look at our country, there's South Africa, you looking at that graph, like you can, I mean, you can definitely see the pie chart. It kind of like looks exactly with A, where it shows that the overall numbers of, um, uh, researchers is mostly male compared to female, um, looking at the, the female authors compared to, to, to the male authors, again, showing that there is a huge gender inequality. Uh, you can go to the next slide. However, thanks to some of the organizations such as Saatchi Chess, which is under a National Research Foundation, Academy of Science, which is also hosting us, and they're very, uh, um, more involved in like trying to find ways to uh, close uh, gender inequality or to make it more um, visible to, to know what's happening. And also the science uh, Department of Science and Technology and also L'Oreal UNESCO and um, also Department of Science and Technology. They used to have South African Women in Science Awards. All these organizations has been really, really, really impressive in terms of showing that actually women are taking over. We are seeing transformation of women in science in leadership positions. And this also shows with this uh, small piece that I wrote with support of science, Department of Science and Technology, where I showed, where I was doing a little bit of tiny research um, just to look at the numbers. And I showed that actually at the workplace, uh, there is transformation. It is still slow, but women are excelling. As we know that we have Prop Kendall Gray, who's the president of uh, South African Medical Research Council. We have Professor um, uh, uh, Karim, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, pro uh, Professor Abdul Karim, who is the, um, the director of the co-founder of Caprisa. And we obviously have a Professor Tibello, who's one of the well-known South African chemists. And obviously, currently, we have more that are coming out because what I, what I love and what I'm seeing that actually women are being taken seriously within the space of research and the space of sciences. And there, there is a little bit of change within that gender inequality. The next slide. So the question would be, with all this that I've shown to you, what are we doing as host or what is our role within this space? Um, as I mentioned initially, our objective is trying to show that they are uh, to show their visibility and to try to, you know, to close the class ceiling, to try to open that opportunity for them to be given opportunities to lead within sciences. So our role is also closing the gap 
trying to make sure that most women in sciences do join our organization because through our organization, they can also know of other activities that are happening within um, women in STEM in our country and internationally. And if you look at our membership, as I mentioned, we have about 505 members and the numbers could have changed because now we are in 2023 and that was from last year. So we have about um, 266 members who are from South Africa, which is a really, really good representation. Um, we do have other members who are from other uh, African countries, such as Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Cameroon, etc. Obviously, um, as much as we are representing our country, we also want to be inclusive because at the end of the day, we are also an African region and we want to make more transformation. But what I, I like about the, the other members that are involved, they are involved within our institutes, institutes within South Africa, which shows that South Africa, it is kind of improving in trying to, to open opportunities for women in science in the different universities within our country. Um, you can go to the next slide. And obviously, um, as our role within this members, we don't just have the members, but we do have um, the six strategic objectives that we support. And obviously, since we belong to the big international organization, our objectives, our strategic objectives are embedded within those uh, the, of the international organization. For instance, we uh, want to increase the participation of women scientists. Uh, it is a bit of a challenge. I'm going to be mentioning some of our challenges as some of the universities in South Africa, they are well disadvantaged or maybe they don't get more opportunities. So for having more women of, in sciences, participation is still a challenge, but we are getting there. And also promoting the recognition of women scientists in developing countries. Um, I do believe to show that we are excellent in South Africa. We do need to have some of women scientists from South Africa going internationally, doing uh, groundbreaking research and representing our country so that other countries, they can want to have their researchers come into our country. It will also show that uh, there is a little bit of that improvement within that space, even though it's not more on the, the gender part, gender inequality part, but it's also saying women in science from South Africa can grow to that kind of level and also promote collaboration and communication about women in scientists. And for me, this is one of the important uh, mandates as coming as the chairperson of um, OS National Chapter from last year, seeing that it would be great to see collaboration within our different institutes of women scientists because we have incredible scientists out there. Some of them are not well known, but they are there doing incredible work. And I just believe with some of um, the activities that we are starting to do that we can be able to bring all these incredible scientists together. Increase access of women in developing countries to socioeconomic benefits of science and technology to also promote participation of women scientists in the development of their country, our country. Um, and it was quite interesting to listen to the talk that was given by DSI, uh, where they mentioned um, the gap of about only like, I, I just wanna check this because this was a very good point. I did write it down, just give me a minute. Oh yes, um, it showed about, there was about 30% of publications where women, this was given by uh, um, Mrs. or Dr. Tina Lutani. Um, showing the stats from 2020. And I was so shocked to see that actually um, in our country, we still have this huge gap where 30% is women and 70% is men. Obviously, this is the data coming from the NRF trying to see the publications. So hopefully there is some change and there is a development where we have at least 50-50% or maybe 60%, not that I'm an NRF feminist, but it would be good to see more women publishing and more women taking, uh, you know, given the platform within the sciences and also increasing understanding of the role of science and technology in supporting women development activities. Um, I think this one is just more about getting the information out there for women in sciences. Can we move to the next slide? And also there are three main days that we highly focus on in closing the gap, research training, research training, doing like workshops, and also science communication workshops that um, were happened a lot, especially during COVID-19. Um, there were more of like workshops focused on storytelling women in science, um, sciences within our country, giving stories about what they've been doing and then networking opportunities. Um, and 
we've learned now to do a lot of webinars ever since COVID, we learned to work like online and some of the networking opportunities is to have webinars to discuss what is happening. For instance, we have um, a collaborated with um, one of the organizations um, in pharmaceuticals for the next month for celebrating International Women's Day, where we're going to have a webinar talking about women in sciences leadership, which is a nice panel discussion where women are engaging and talking and changing numbers, networking, trying to work together because sometimes you don't, they don't even know that there are other women doing research that they're doing. And then career development, which is the most important one, because I believe if we have more well-known scientists within our country, which is our women, when we have challenges such as pandemics, we can rely within our um, scientists within our country, but because the development is still low, there's few fellowships that is av are available out there for women in sciences. So one of the things that we do, we work highly closely with uh, OST International, trying to find out if there's any fellowship for early career scientists to be given a master's fellowship and PhD fellowships, or also like research visit fellowships to help women in science within our country to develop. And again, also there are other activities uh, where we involved, but not 100% fully involved. Activities at the science police interface, working in partnerships with us. Obviously, there was a police makers booklet which was published, which focused on required based science education, increasing participation of girls in science in sub-Saharan Africa. And also, we all know about the Science Forum South Africa, um, and also selected gender summits, Africa convenings. And I did go to one of the agenda summits and it was mind blowing. I felt like I could see there are people that I've seen that there has to be change. Women has to be given a chance to grow. We do know that everywhere it's all about women, but it's not technically about women, but it's about the potential that they do have, that they can lead, they, we can close this gap and we can just rather have 50-50, both men and women be given opportunities to grow in sciences. Go to the next slide. And as I mentioned earlier about one of our challenges, um, one of our challenges is that there is a, in terms of membership engagement and transformation, there is an underrepresentation of historically disadvantaged institutions. And I feel like this is a great platform for, for me to talk about this because um, historically disadvantaged institutions, including the University of Venda, Zululand, UWC, et cetera. So I do believe like if we could reach out to those women and also for them to be involved, it would be, it will help. So to move forward with this, we have uh, come up with conceptualized a concept note together working with ASAF. We are grateful to have ASAF hosting us. Um, and then we have um, dele delegated or have identified a researcher who's gonna be helping us to run a study, to try to see what are the gaps, why most women within historically disadvantaged institutions are not well informed. Because we know mostly when we hear about women in science, it's either you get UCT, Stellenbosch University, Wirtz University, you know, it's it's always like the, those ones that are well known. And, and what about the other universities where we have University of Port here? We might have incredible women scientists there. But what I've seen also some of the challenges is that they don't have the information. So what we're trying to see, we, we're like trying to see why those, what are the indicators that show that there is this gap? How can we solve it? And the best way to do this is to do a survey, to do a study, which we're grateful to have support from DSI and also to have support from our staff to be, to be coming to do that. Obviously we have a concept note, so the study is going to happen. Um, it's not just something that we're saying, but we are definitely gonna do it to close that gap. And again, under representation of women scientists in high leadership positions in sciences and academia. I mean, this is one of the most important ones because the more we, more women are given opportunities, but we, there's still the stigma that women in sciences or women, when they lead, they can be emotional and et cetera, but we're trying to break this. But I'm very, very proud to be born in an era where we have the VC of the University of Cape Town being a woman, where we have SMRC being the, the president being a woman, where also we saw UNISA, we have again, again, VC who is a woman. So there is some transformation. And from our pool of members, we're trying to see if we could help them. Unfortunately, the challenges with this one is that we can only 
have helped them through visibility, trying to profile the women and trying to have this engagement activities. However, it would be great to also get some views from, the, from everyone. If you do have anything that you can help us to see how we can get more women in leadership positions within science and academia without them being considered as women can lead to a certain level. Because I do believe women are powerful, women can lead, as long as they know their priority straight. And there are incredible women in sciences out there that needs opportunities, but they've never been given those opportunities. Even when they do apply, if you have your name and I mean, if you only have your surname, you can be considered, but if you have your name and surname, it's one of those challenges. Can this person do this job or not? So we want to change that. And again, a lack of more funding opportunities for capacity building within the organization. This is one of our challenges to have a secretary aid. I mean, during COVID-19, we struggled, we struggled a lot, but I just love our team. Um, it, it, we worked together very well. Uh, with that time, we also had um, Dr. Now, she's a doctor, Dorothy, who was the chair and I was the vice chair. And I had to take over within that time where it was a challenge because there wasn't more funds to, to do more. But at the same time, for us to try to figure out how we're going to do more during this pandemic, but also coming out of the pandemic. We're grateful for the support of us of NDSI, but we still do want more support as an organization to get capacity building because some of the work requires us to have, um, you know, like capacity since we are volunteers in this organization, but we're very passionate volunteers because regardless of what we face, we, we are up for doing our best. You can move. Okay, the way forward for OST, obviously, as I mentioned, we want to increase participation of women scientists in scientific and technological research, teaching and leadership. Through SAF, continue to close our working relationship, um, continue our close working relationship with DSI and maintain relationship with our national chapters in other African countries of which I did go to support Zimbabwe, where I gave a talk and I also was participating in one of their panel discussions about uh, the global issues that women are facing and what are we doing to, to make a difference. And it was quite interesting to see most of the things resonates with what is happening in our country. Um, so it is good for us to maintain this relationship to ensure that uh, we are going together to see where the gaps are. With this, I would give it back to Dr. Melusi. Thank you, Chair. With your permission, Chair, just to close off on the presentation with the last slide. Um, also something that an um, activity that ASAP is proud of um, is the nomination of um, uh, female leaders to various working groups and um, within the continent, uh, as well as internationally. Now, South Africa is represented by these top academics in that regard. And, and we are proud uh, that ASAP and various partners actually plays a role in uh, nominating those top um, women leaders in, in, in their regard. It is also um, a proud moment to have here our Vice President, Professor Stephanie Bertin, being a co-chair of the Inter-Academy uh, Governing Board. Now, the Inter-Academy Partnership is the global umbrella um, body of um, uh, science academies. And we are very proud to have, from a South African perspective, a top uh, science leader uh, representing South Africa in that regard. And recently, to the General uh, Assembly um, Conference uh, towards the end of 2022, the delegation that was partly nominated by and supported by ASA was also 100% uh, female. When we engaged uh, within the continent um, as uh, science academies, at the annual meeting of African Science Academies in Kenya in December, we had a 50% uh, female representation within the delegation. Also, in the ASAP seats within uh, the UNESCO Natural Sciences Committee that is on a national scale, uh, we have 50% um, female representativity. Apologies for that delay. Now coming to the um, other important component that the academy executes, being the science advisory component. 
Now, this is uh, driven largely or informed by the standing committees, uh, standing committees uh, on various disciplines. We've got a standing committee on health, and there's many others that um, exist. We are proud to indicate uh, that uh, there is relatively good uh, female uh, representation there, and these are top leaders in their in their own discipline that guide us up as well as the country in terms of the science advisory. Currently, we are in the process, Chair, of um, formulating the humanities as well as the STEM standing committees. Now, we've gone at length to ensure inclusivity from an institutional perspective, um, and this we've done by ensuring that all the provinces actually get represented in this, uh, in this regard but also there is a gender inclusivity lens that has been applied in this regard. The review panels that are um, appointed or endorsed at ASAF Council um, always have to um, have gender inclusivity in their regard, otherwise they do not get approved. Otherwise, exceptional cases have to be strongly justified. And this is just goes to a lens to show that um, ASAF takes the issue of gender inclusivity um, quite seriously. And these are panels that are formulated from national representative, uh, continental, as well as overseas representation. Our study panels, which are the drivers of the science advisory studies that we execute, are only endorsed if they have a lens of gender inclusivity. And with your permission, Chair, I'd just like to um, go uh, add another bullet there, which was not in the original uh, presentation. We thought we'd like to share um, to this committee um, one of uh, the achievements uh, or processes that uh, ASAP is executing. Now, we have been commissioned by the International Development Research Center in Canada to execute a study that uh, actually assesses the barriers for women in progressing um, in STEM-related fields within the African research universities. Now, in this study, Chair, we examined characteristics such as gender existence of gender policies within these universities, um, transformation policies, and gender-based violence, and gender pay gaps as being amongst um, the, 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 the parameters that we um, evaluated amongst uh, these universities. So now this is where we approached um, uh, uh, academics in those universities just to understand what they feel um, are their views on those uh, issues, but we also look at uh, official documentation or policies and strategies of those uh, universities. So within the science advisory mandate, um, Chair, we are very proud that there is good representation by uh, female scientists. Obviously, we are not relaxing because there's still you know, a, a lot of work to be done, but ASAP is making good strides in this regard. And with that, Chair, I would like to end the, the presentation. Thank you for the permission to present to, to this uh, portfolio committee. I will unshare my slides. Thank you. Thank you both, Melusi and Caroline, for those wonderful presentations. With that, Chair, I hand back over to you from ASA. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, um, for your presentation. That was our presentation from ASAF, another very informative uh, presentation. I'd like to then hand over to um, our last entity to present today, and that is the CGE, led by the CEO, um, Ms. Nkomo, as well as the chair, um, the acting chair, Ms. Mazibugo. Um, I'd like to hand over to Ms. Mazibuga, who will then hand over to the CEO. Thank you, Chair. Is the acting chair with us this morning? I'm not sure if I'm seeing. She is actually, uh, but she's locked in as a Likateko. Yes, there she oh, is. Okay. okay. Is the acting chair with us this morning? Yes, yes, yes. Actually, I'm here. Someone's got their TV on or okay. another device thank you on. Much. Thank, thank, you thank you very much. Yes, yes, yes. Someone's got their TV on or another device.
There we go. Okay. All right. We can continue then. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear and see you. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members. we have a crisis, colleagues. There's a dev that device. I don't know if it's a computer or if it's a uh, a TV screen, but the other we device needs crisis, to be. Colleagues. There's a dev that device. I don't know if it's a computer or if it's a uh, a TV screen, but the other device needs to be. That device. I don't know. If so let's increase the volume on the laptop or the iPad, and then let's decrease the volume on the TV. So let's increase the volume on the laptop or the iPad, and then let's decrease the volume on the TV. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Okay. I'm very sorry for for the uh, bad communication. Okay. Good morning. I'm very sorry. Okay. Can I ask Chair? Can I ask that we sort out your devices and then we just allow for the CEO to take us through the dust before we chair, hand over to members and we'll come back to you, Chair, for from, for remarks from yourself. Just allow for the CEO. Because we can't have the, the, the echo. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I ask the CEO to proceed if my gadget is not uh, coordinate, co correlating with you? Is it That's better fine. now? It's it's better now, actually. It is sure. better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. There we go. I think we're fine now. Honorable Lutzi, I see your hand is... Sorry, sorry uh, Chair. Honorable Lutzi, I see your hand is up. Yeah, no, um, sorry, Chair. I wanted to suggest it seems like um, where the chair or the team chair of council is there are two devices uh, on, in the same room. So they must just mute the volume of the second device that she's not using now. Yeah, I think they did that. So I think that's why it's, it's, it's better now. Thank you, Honorability. Um, thank you, Honorable Itzie. And then over to you, Chair, for your opening remarks, and you hand over to the CEO. Thank you very much. And can I apologize for the technical teach? Uh, that's technology for us. Uh, Chairperson, Honorable Members, thank you very much for the, uh, uh, for the invitation from the Gender, uh, gender Committee. It is grateful to the Portfolio Committee on Higher Education and Training for the invitation to present its work around the Tibet Colleges in line with the current wave of gender-based violence and femicide at the institution of higher learning and training. And a concerted effort by all of the role players is required to deal with this, in, in, uh, this challenge. The report to be presented by the Commission of Gender Equality to this portfolio is very important to study their unique environment and gender di dynamics. In pursuit of these TWS colleges to in place to see the progressive transformation measures to assist the creation of a healthy learning environment. The report presented by the commission is a progress record, report that demonstrates the strides made by the TVET colleges to innovation, deal with transformation broadly at their various campuses. The report similarly highlights the current challenges that is impaired in transformation of various levels of these institutions. I have with me the CEO of the commission and the head of legal, who is going to take us through the presentation this morning. With these few words, I want to welcome the CEO to introduce Dr. Matotoka. Over to you, CEO. Thank you so much, uh, 
and thank you so much, honorable members, uh, uh, the chair of the portfolio committee, and as well as the committee members. Just want to acknowledge that in our midst, we have our the commissioners um, of the Commission for Gender Equality. I saw Ms. Commissioner Busiso Gayi. I saw uh, Commissioner um, uh, Lindu Wendu Lichobata is in the midst. I saw Commissioner Tibiela Mutupi, um, you know, who are also part of this uh, conversation. I think the fact that, you know, we've come as a big team also indicates, you know, our commitment into wanting to share our, our, um, our research. I think I just want to make three points, Chen, and then I'll head over to the um, to Dr. Matotok. I mean, just to say that we actually really appreciate the committee's intersectional oversight approach around this issue, because no one would think about linking, you know, science and as well as a transformation in, in institutional program, uh, institutions of high learning, and particularly focusing on issues around employment. So we truly appreciate it. I think one of the key things that we've committed ourselves, the commission, is to always make it sure that we present a human evidence base around gender equity so that, in fact, both those who have a, were part of the ecosystem around uh, gender-based violence and oversight, but also those who are meant to execute and allocate resources in eradicating gender-based violence or any forms of gender oppression that they use our data to make sure that they make a difference. With those words, Chair, I would really like to call upon Dr. Matutoka to, uh, to make um, his presentation. And the format really, Chair, what we've done is that we're going to highlight about, we've done about uh, several um, TV colleges, but also we're going to take through comments in terms of what were the findings each at Tibet colleges, and overall, we're going to then do uh, overall a conclusion on what we the recommendations that we have uh, put forward to the Tibet colleges for them to actually implement to deal with uh, gender-based violence and gender equity leadership issues. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Dr. Matoka. Hey, thank you so much, uh, CEO. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, honorable members. Um, I will be taking you through the presentation to demonstrate the progress that have been made by the uh, Tibet colleges that appeared before the commission from the year 2021 up until the 2022 uh, financial year. I'll request uh, Mikateko to just then beam the presentation so that we can then go into detail. Mika? All right, let's just go to the first slide, please. The next slide, please. Good morning, Dr. Matotoka. My apologies. Um, can I please just have just a few seconds? I'm not sure what's going on on my end. Thank you. All right, Th that is fine. Um, honorable members, I can talk to the issue while we're trying to sort out the technical aspect regarding our, our slides. So we have transformation hearings in the financial year uh, 2021 and the financial year 2022 and 2023 respectively. But at the end of the financial year 2022, we were conducting what we call progress reports on the implementations of recommendations by a number of Tibet colleges that appeared before the commission. We do so to ensure that the projects that are commenced by the CGE, they are not uh, just kept without implementation by the organization. So every financial year when we in, in, in start any investigation, we ensure that the preceding financial year, we then conduct a monitoring to ensure that there is compliance. So in the financial year in question, we had three, I mean, four Tibet colleges that appeared before us and for progress purposes. And that was Waterbeck Tibet College, which is based in Mbopo, and that we had in Gangala Tibet College that is based in Mpumalanga, and we had the Northern Cape Tibet College that is based in the Northern Cape, and then we also had the Northwest Tibet College that is based in the Gauteng um, province. So in terms of this process, the objective was to ensure that 
to assess the extent in which these entities comply with legislative frameworks that persuade gender transformation within the workplace. We also looked at the funding to students and colleges and to assess whether there's improvement in education and skills development. The objective also included the vulnerabilities and the risk experienced by women in Tibet colleges as employees and as staff members, students, and the whole broad community to assess whether gender-based violence is also addressing that criteria. We also assess the general level of non-compliance by employers around employment equity legislations. That includes Labor Relations Act, the Employment Equity Act, the Common Law, and the Broad Base uh, Act is equally. That deals with the affirmation of rights in the workplace. We also looked at the reasons, wanted to ascertain the reasons why employers fail to comply with certain obligations espoused within different legislations, and also ascertain the obstacles faced by women in the workplace with regard to the existing legislation to address issues relating to transformation and gender-based violence broadly within the workplace. We also wanted to assess the nature of amendments that should be proposed in respect of the current reform to existing legislation. So we, we assess the, the, the presentations and the documents that we obtain from these entities and from those documents, we then ascertain what is it that we can propose as, a, as the Commission for Gender Equality to fast track issues of transformation within the workplace. So for example, you'll have a, a challenge where women would argue or the, the evidence that is submitted is demonstrate that women are not able to have <clears throat> breastfeeding facilities within the workplace. And then we as the Commission then decide what to do with such information. Do we push for a policy framework? Do we push for a regulation around childcare facilities within the workplace to cater for the needs and interests of all women within the workplace? So that is the angle that <clears throat> we are referring to there. We also assess the relevant gender equality provisions in international instruments which have not been mainstreamed in existing and proposed legislation. We assess the reasonable expectation of potential and permanent employees regarding labor legislation that will address the concerns of women in that regard. Equally, we look at the shortcomings within the workplace which impede gender transformation and propose remedial actions or remedial measures. And another objective is to make relevant recommendations to institutions to ensure compliance with employment equity. So the, the legislation that we rely on as the commission, we, as I've indicated, they center around transformative tools. This will include the Labor Relations Act, the Employment Equity Act, and all other transformative legislation. We want to use or we use those legislations as a methodology or the methodology that was used to take into consideration those legislations because it is those legislations currently that foster transformation within the workplace. And then what would then happen is then we will issue a subpoena against um, the principal of the school to come before the commission and account. So with regard to the first entity, which is what I've activated, I must mention honorable members that the, the first presentation that we did before this portfolio committee last year demonstrated a number of challenges with these colleges. But what we'll demonstrate here today is the impact that these hearings have had on these colleges to implement some of the transformative measures that at the end of the day created an enabling environment for all staff members and employee, I mean, and, and students within the, these TVET colleges. But we are still fraught with particular challenges and we'll take you through those. So the college appeared before the commission for the first time on the 19th of November, 2021. And the commission made the following recommendations that the sexual harassment policy must be adopted by June, 2021. And it must be aligned with the code of good practice in the handling of sexual harassment of the year 2005. And we've recommended also that the college must review their policies because we found that their policies were gender blind and gender insensitive. The college was also recommended to conduct sexual harassment training, and we requested that the CG must be invited to partake in those hearings. The reason why we made such a recommendation is that as the CG, we understand that sexual harassment is a barrier for transformation within the workplace. And therefore, the, and it, it, it violates the dignity and the equality rights of students and staff members within the workplace. Therefore, there's that responsibility and duty placed on organizations 
to put in place measures and processes that will ensure that inequality and oppressions that come as a result of sexual harassment is addressed. And we ensure that we attend those trainings to assess whether comprehensive information is shared with staff members and whether those who facilitated the, pro the, the, the program have a full understanding around the discourse of sexual harassment. Because what we are able to find honorable members is that when we recommend such uh, trainings, it, it, they are not prioritized by employers. They only share policies to staff members. They only share policies if they do have with, with students and they, they leave it there. So we recommend that there must be comprehensive training of sexual harassment around, uh, around campuses that will benefit students, that will also benefit staff members as a whole. We have requested the, the TVET also to submit a designated data demonstrating employees who were promoted in the past three financial years. At the time, it was from 2017 up until 2020, I mean, 2019, because we wanted to assess also the, the intention, whether there's an intentional commitment by the, the, the Tibet College to foster transformation in various occupational levels within the, the workplace. Because on one hand, you do have policy frameworks that says they target persons with disabilities and they target uh, women broadly. But we must see practical measures where indeed it demonstrates that there is an intention to promote women in occupational levels that largely are of decision nature and um, decision making nature in, in broadly. And then we've requested the Tibet College to also submit a, an advertisement that targeted persons with disabilities. So this was also for us to verify that indeed, because the, the, what we're able to unearth from the occupational representation was that at senior management level and, and, and junior management, there was poor representation. In fact, there was no representation of persons with disability. And this raised a concern to the commission. And we wanted to see how their advertisements are crafted. Are they purposeful in nature? Are they targeting persons with disability? And are they also creating an environment where there is a reasonable accommodation for persons with disability? So we requested that advertisement so that we can verify that indeed persons with disabilities are prioritized in terms of their recruitment processes. The college must also develop a policy framework that ensures continuity, accountability, and transparency in implementing equality and non-discriminatory transformative initiatives. The reason all our members we made this recommendation was that we were able to unearth a vision that was presented by the principal, the vision that talks to transformation in, in broadly within the institution. But our concern was that should the principal leave and these measures and these visions are not documented and they are not adopted as a form of policy, we may end up losing these progressive measures and it will take the, the TV and college back to square one. So the lack of continuity and accountability was not clear in terms of policy framework. And it was from that basis that we recommended that the, there must be that policy framework that ensures continuity. And we were able to unearth that say there was no sexual harassment policy, which was a great concern to the commission. It's a concern because it is common cause that sexual harassment currently within the workplace is, is very much prevalent. We have seen a um, number of judgments that have been pronounced by the courts that gave clear indication that sexual harassment should not be tolerated within its workplace. And equally, it demonstrated how the impact, the negative impact of sexual harassment is to larger uh, work employees. So we needed, if policies to be de de developed and we needed measures to also be outlined as to how that information is going to be cascaded all the way from junior staff members to top management. And again, as we said, we said we, they must also review their policies because they were gender blind. Now, in terms of the progress that was submitted in the report under discussion, the college was able to conduct a sexual harassment training to the satisfaction of the Commission for Gender Equality. We were able to even observe how this uh, sexual harassment policy was, I mean, training was conducted, and we were pleased that uh, the, the, the TVET had committed 
and in short that transformation from, from, from a sexual harassment angle is really materializing. But the, the Tibet went beyond that, honorable members, and which that's what really pleases us. They, they, they conducted what we call, or what they call as a gender-based violence summit, right? And from that gender-based violence summit that was held in 2021, there were a number of issues that came out of the summit. And those issues included the fact that the communities did not see gender-based violence as a problem, and they didn't see the need to report such. They also, they, from that issue also came out an angle that says cultural practices endorsed gender-based violence within the area where this college was, um, was situated. And equally, women did not get the necessary joy and protection from communities whenever they wanted to report gender-based violence within the, the, the campuses or within the community broadly. Additional to that, which we, we also thought is a progressive measure, was the fact that the college conducted a survey, a survey to determine the, 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 the gender dynamics and the risks that are existing within campus. So they did a head, hunt, a head count of about 2,461 students and they, they disseminated a questionnaire. And that questionnaire spoke to about 562 students who participated in that. And there was something fundamental that came out of that survey. It, re, it demonstrated that about 23 students were at risk of gender-based violence, and they were subject to all forms of, of victimization, including sexual harassment, uh, rapes, and, 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 and physical assault from their intimate partners. The survey also demonstrated that 24 students were at risk of mental health and related problems. And I must pause here, honorable members, because why we are satisfied with this survey and would recommend um, that other institutions emulate it is because as the CGE, we are of the view that there must be risk assessment that are initiated by employers and that assist the employers to create that enabling environment to pick up issues that are not easily reported and act on those issues decisively so. So this was a proactive measure. And from that proactive measure, we were able to identify 24 students that had mental, issue, uh, mental related issues, but also 23 students who were at risk of gender-based violence. And it is from that premise that we then recommended that the, the, the institution must provide the necessary support through the, the psychosocial support system, but also engage in the South African police service for those students who were at risk of, of being sexually assaulted, physically assaulted, and those who were already subjected to those in that category. So we, we, saw, we saw this as a progressive measure, and we recommend it even in other institutions that let us not wait to see somebody or a student being killed or a staff member being killed. Proactively take measures as an employer to identify the risks that exist within your workplace and act accordingly. That, in our view, you are discharging your duty of care as an employer. Now, in terms of the, the progress also around the, the, the promotion statistics, the college was able to provide the, the statistics and the statistics does demonstrate that this, there is a fair representation of, of males and females that were promoted between the year 2017 up until the year 2021. The difference is literally just one. Seven um, males were promoted to leadership positions and only six females were were, sub, were promoted to senior positions as well. With regard to the advertisement that I've raised earlier on, the advertisement was, was submitted by the Tibet College and we were able to satisfy ourselves that from that advertisement, uh, persons with disabilities are definitely um, prioritized. But something also significant came out of our interactions with the the college around this discourse was that they, they did not have an employment equity committee uh, for over two years. And when we intervened around the issue of persons with disabilities not being represented in any occupational level, they developed the employment equity committees. And the first one set literally weeks before our first engagement. And we requested the minutes of those employment equity committees to ascertain whether the issues of transformations 
are really prioritized and particularly on persons with disability. We wanted to know what are the measures being put in there. And we were pleased that from the, from the minutes, we we're able to ascertain that the, the, the chairperson of the committee or rather the committee broadly acknowledged that there is an urgent need to address the paucity of persons with disabilities at various occupational levels at the Waterberg TVET. And they also conducted a survey to determine rather an audit to determine the, the buildings that can be uh, uh, that can be utilized to provide reasonable accommodation but what we did not have was a prescribed time period within which that uh, that committee needed to complete the audit and then start to action specific uh, uh, um, measures to create reasonable accommodation for persons with disability so we were happy in, in that regard the, with regard to the policy framework that promotes continuity, the college did mention that it is still in the process of developing it. And it is from that basis that we continue to work with the Waterbeck TVET to ensure that this policy that promotes continuity and accountability is implemented. But I must mention here, honorable members, that one of the key challenges, and you'll see even in other colleges, the, the development of policies seem to be the a prerogative of the Department of Higher Education and Training. It, it is as if, according to the submission that is made by various TV colleges, that it, it is not up to them to develop policies on their own accord. They must be directed by the Department of Higher Education. And as I conclude for the Waterbury TVET, it, we are able to, to, to be satisfied that the committee or rather the college demonstrated its commitment to achieve equity in the workplace. And this was also again demonstrated by the appointment of the female principal who, who appeared before the commission. The appointment of female principal is seen as an achievement towards equity in leadership roles. The college has complied with most of the recommendations from the 2020 report, and we as the CGE shall continue to work with them in the province of Limpopo. However, we also recommended that the college needs to develop, to, needs to develop plans to render the necessary support to the 23 students that are at risk of gender-based violence and victimization, and the 24 students that are currently at risk from suffering from mental health related problems. We've emphasized that the college needs to finalize together with the Department of Higher Education, the policies that are, that, that are gender blind and gender insensitive because there might be an intention, but the, the unintended consequences of, of, of some policies may result in discrimination of some, some uh, students or staff members on the grounds of, of equality or gender. We have also recommended now that the colleges, as per the Employment Equity Committee, it needs to put in timeframes within which an audit of infrastructure will be completed to create reasonable accommodation for persons with disability. So we were all broadly satisfied with the, the progress report that was submitted by the Waterbeck TVET. However, we acknowledge that transformation is a process. They have made some strides in implementing the recommendations, but there are still challenges and will continue to work with this uh, Tibet College in, 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 in the province of Limpopo. Honorable members, the next entity that appeared was Nkangala Tibet College. This is an Mpumalanga based uh, organization or Tibet College, which also appeared before us on the 18th of November 2021 to provide progress in implementing the recommendations of the CG report of 2020. And from that report, we have made an array of recommendations. And that included the following, that the college must ensure that it implements employment equity with the plan in place to recruit persons with disability. In addition, the college needed to work with disability organizations in, in Pumalanga. Honorable members, the reason why we make such a recommendation of this one in particular is that we often get explanations from, from entities that appear before us that persons with disabilities cannot be allocated. And I'll give one of the one of the universities also outlined the same view that um, persons with disabilities uh, cannot be located. But on the converse side, you do find you have students with disabilities attending at various colleges or at various um, institution. Nothing prohibits uh, the, these institutions to earmark 
or to, to target such students for, 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 for various occupations within the workplace. So their inability to even I see that as a measure was something that was problematic to the CGE. And we recommended that they must look at various organizations to see whether they cannot recruit Right? They cannot recruit persons with disabilities. They cannot engage universities to also ascertain or determine a, a, a pool that can be eligible for various positions within the, their respective workplaces. Because disability is, is, is not a, a, it should not be a ticking box. There must be a deliberate um, effort by these organizations to ensure that nobody is discriminated on the basis of their disability. And their exclusion at various occupational levels remains a, a, a consent to the Commission for Gender Equality. So it is from that, that, that basis that we made such, such recommendations around persons with disabilities. We've also recommended that there must be uh, mechanisms to track and manage cases of gender-based violence within and outside campus. Again, we're talking about the risk assessment. We're talking about these proactive measures that must be explored by organizations. It really does not help in our view where you see that there is a challenge, but you are not doing anything about it as, as, as a college or as an institution. So we always advocate for those innovative measures to ensure that issues around gender-based violence within and outside campus are addressed by, by organizations. We've also indicated that the Department of Higher Education and, and the Department of Labor must play an active role in monitoring the implementation of employment equity plans by TVET colleges. Because what we were able to unearth was that employment equity plans are developed. And where there is non-compliance, there appears not to be any consequences around that. And there's no clear justification as to why certain things are, or certain goals or numerical, numerical goals outlined within the, the, the plans are not achieved. So it is from that premise where we say, but the department has to play that active role. Why are certain goals not being achieved? What measures are being outlined in the plans? Are they decisive? Are they measurable? Are they tangible for us to achieve transformation? So we recommended that there must be that deliberate monitoring by our two um, departments to deal with the monitoring of um, employment equity plans. So as part of the, the, the progress that was provided by Gangala Tibet College, we were happy because now there was something unique that they were doing um, with regard to their own workplace or within their own gender dynamics in the province to deal with gender-based violence and, and persons with disabilities. So again, on their part, the, the underrepresentation of persons with disability was acknowledged and they also put out adverts that deliberately targeted persons with disabilities and committed also to engage organizations that deal largely with disabilities within Pumalanga and outside. And also the college had, had, had an issue around gender-based violence. So part of the progress report that was provided was that the college indicated that it was consulting its current security company to address gender-based violence. And the mechanism that was now identified by the college was the NAMOLA app, which assists in locating and sharing and tracking students' movement when there's a, there's, there's safety concern. So how they explained this app was that whenever there's, the student is experiencing danger or in need of medical healthcare, there is a press button that can be utilized and then once that, that, that button is pressed, it is able to, it is linked to the security personnel within the, the, the campus. And there's a, there's a 30 seconds uh, response time to, to address the, 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 any staff member or a student who will have pressed that button. So the a commitment was also made that the app will be installed on the cell phones of all students and, and staff members. We are going to see in this new financial year as we are going to be monitoring whether they were able to achieve and are there any specific emerging issues coming out of this new innovative media that they are using to track the, the students that may be susceptible to gender-based violence in, in, in and outside their campuses. The issue around the employment equity plans by the college was also satisfied, I mean, uh, submitted to the CG to our satisfaction. However, we remain concerned that 
the, these numerical targets are outlined and there's clear commitment and intention to, to, to ensure that the lack of equity is, is, is addressed by various mechanisms um, that are outlined within the plans. But we, we continue to worry that without a clear monitoring um, by the DHEAD and the Department of Labor around this, this issue, because it falls within their, their jurisdiction also, we will end up with employment equity plans that are, are adopted and approved, but even if there are no achievements to that, it's like we then have to um, accept and come up with new employment equity plans. So with, with the, the TVET itself, we're happy in as far as the gender-based violence uh, mechanism that they put in place, but, and we'll continue to work with it in Mpumalanga, particularly around the issues around equity and transformation because they remain a concern. They have appointed principals that are largely male. The professional services within the TVET colleges are male dominated equally, yet you see that in their academic positions, students are largely dominating in those male dominated fields. So it will be very much interesting to see from our perspective, how the, out, the, the outputs of, of, of the, the, those programs result in some of these students being absorbed by, by, the, by, the, the, by the college as a mechanism to ensure that equity is achieved in those occupational levels where there's under representation of uh, designated groups. Honorable members, in, in our last presentation, we've highlighted the challenges that we had with the Northern Cape uh, TVET College, where they failed to appear before the commission. And at the time when we were presenting this, the minister was there, and we highlighted that we, we, we experienced challenges with the, the, the college, and the principal has failed to provide us with adequate uh, progress around the implementation of the CGE recommendations. So to this date, we still are unable to demonstrate whether the initial recommendations that were made by the commission to the Tibet College were implemented. We have then resolved to issue a section 18 process where criminal charges must be laid against the accounting officer that failed to appear before the commission. The last college, is the Southwest College. Um, it's one of those entities that we had for the first time because in the first, in, uh, first round of hearings, they were not prepared. They did not give us adequate information. So in the past financial year, that's when they gave us an array of information for the first time. And we made a number of recommendations to them equally. And this include the following, that the college should provide accurate statistics around the number of sexual harassment cases pending and finalized by the end of February, 2022. The reason was that the, the institution said it does not have uh, cases of, of sexual harassment around students, but around the list that they provided, it included a, list, a, a case where three students were subjected to, to sexual harassment. So we needed clarity around that because if the system itself cannot capture the correct number of cases, it, 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 it raises serious concerns to the commission. We've requested that the key performance areas for the deputy principal um, be shared with us so that we can ascertain whether the gender marks are also included in the KPAs. Because sometimes we do have uh, challenges where a, a person at a senior level is tasked with championing gender transformation within the workplace, but the KPA does not even deal, does not even include that. Therefore, even if there is no achievement of specific aspirations, there are no consequences for that. So we wanted to ascertain whether that KPA talks specifically to the issues of gender, uh, goals and, 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 and targets accordingly. We have requested, <clears throat> rather recommended that the college should finalize its sexual harassment policy by the end of uh, February, 2022. And equally, it must be aligned with the 2005 code. Um, but when we made this, it, it, it was before we the, the minister promulgated the 2022 code that dealt with sexual harassment. So it will be interesting now to see whether there has been a, a move from 2005 codes by these uh, Tibet colleges to now draw issues of bullying and intimidation within the, the current uh, policy framework that the code is advocating for. And we've also committed to, to engage 
uh, the, the, the college and assist them with policy development where we identified policy gaps. But again, as I've said previously here, one of our key challenges is that it appears that the, the development of policies lies squarely with the Department of Higher Education. So even when we offer our expertise, we are referred to the Department of, of, education, of Higher Education. The college was able to provide the necessary statistics. And what we were able to see from, from the data was that again, the, the representation of women um, and, and persons with disabilities at top, and manage, at top senior management positions remained a concern. So again, you had employment equity plans that clearly targeted women, that clearly targeted persons with disabilities, but you don't have measures, clear measures, defined measures in those plans to achieve those goals. So it's, it, it appears to be a ticking box at the end of the day. So we, we are saying we, we shouldn't just tick the existence of a, an employment equity plan, but we must zoom into the employment equity plan and ascertain, are these measures defined? Can we hold them accountable? Should there be no achievement of certain aspirations within these plans? And that is one thing that we've been consistent as the CGE so that when we draft plans, there must be commitment and there must be accountability for failing to achieve certain aspirations therein. We were able to ascertain that the, the sexual harassment is in a draft format and they are relying on the disciplinary code for public servants resolution one of 2003. Honorable members, I want to pause here because there's something that they've also highlighted to us, which was a bit of a concern, was that they do not have sexual harassment workshops. They don't have what they call sexual harassment workshops. They don't do that. They just have broad workshops that deals with, with uh, transformation and uh, largely they, they would have women's dialogues during women's month and they will have GBV campaigns, but they don't have a, a, a specific a workshop that, that deals with sexual harassment. And which, which is, again, it's something that is, is concerning to the CGE, especially when we look at the, 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 the influx of cases that we observe in the TVET colleges, the influx of cases that are reported within the, the, the CCMA, the Beginning Council, they, 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 it cannot be that an institution with such a community does not have uh, sexual harassment workshops because the codes of good practice themselves, they even say, as an employer, you must hold sexual harassment campaigns. You must educate your staff members. You must educate your, stu your students around the, the, the sexual harassment because it's not easily understood. We as the commission have held and this sexual harassment training. And most of the time, when we, we conclude those sessions, you can tell and assess that this is still an, a, an area that is not fully understood by, by, by most people in society. Even those who are professionals, how it evolves through the courts, it requires a deliberate effort by an employer to share developments around this so that we, we don't have a situation where any employee or a student will say, I didn't know that my conduct amounted to sexual harassment. Because we do know that as it, as it is often said that ignorance of the law is not an excuse. The fact that you didn't know that your conduct amounted to sexual harassment is not an excuse for you not to be held accountable for that. But, but then there's also that deliberate uh, responsibility on the employer to impart knowledge around sexual harassment, what it means, when it, and, and its position, you must have a zero tolerance as, as an institution. So if you have a zero tolerance, but you don't even share anything around that, it is problematic. They've also highlighted that part of the, although they don't do sexual harassment, but information around abuse, it's, it's, it's kept on its internet or it's available on the website. Now, from our side, we become concerned that if you're confining information um, on the website, how about the, the, the administrative staff members who do not use your facilities such as, as your internet? And I'm talking here somebody who's cleaning the garden, I'm talking about somebody who's cleaning the, the, the dishes and, and in, in the workplace, or somebody at the admin who doesn't deal with such things. How do you expect these people to, on their own, 
know what is important in terms of, of, of sexual harassment or, or, or abuse or victimization if this information is just kept on the internet. So we, 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 we are very much concerned around this that the institution is not doing enough to share and, and create that enabling environment for, for its staff members and student, student. And therefore it created a huge risk from, from, from our side because the information was not disseminated accordingly. Now, interestingly, the, the college had a number. So from, they said they don't have cases, but from their submission, we're able to pick up a number of cases that were reported by, by the students themselves. So this is where we're coming from, honorable members, that if you have so many cases that have been reported by students, it should say to you as an employer, what is it that I must do? And the last thing you must do under such circumstances is to put information on the website. We have availed ourselves to the, to the college to say, we are more than ready to assist with the the holding of sexual harassment uh, workshops to ensure that this information is properly shared with the student community or the, the Tibet College as a whole. We were able to find that they, they did not have uh, succession and retention plans um, around gender issue. And again, the, the, the explanation that we get here is that they cannot develop such on their own. It is the prerogative of the Department of Higher Education and Training. They also didn't have an employment equity manager, which is something that the Employment Equity Act requires because you need somebody at a senior level to champion issues of gender transformation and will be able to influence the leadership of an organization to prioritize gender transformation within the workplace. They don't have that, but they did mention that the deputy principal that deals with corporate governance um, has been assigned to deal with such. So it will be interesting to see with this appointment, how, how does the, the principal fare with, when it comes to transformation issues? Are they being prioritized or are we just appointing for the sake of, 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 of I mean, for, for ticking box purposes? So we will be ascertaining whether from 2022 up until now, what impact has this appointment of this deputy principal had on transformation within the workplace? The college also submitted that they, they did not have any promotions from 2017 up until the end of that financial year, that is 2022. But they indicated that for acting positions, they have prioritized females in leadership positions. We acknowledge that um, because one of our, our, our considered view is that we often argue that women do not have the necessary skills and expertise to assume leadership positions. But in the same breath, we don't give them opportunities. And I think one of the previous speakers talked about it, that there's that, 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 that notion that women don't have skills and expertise to assume leadership roles. But you cannot say that if, as an employer, you deliberately do not give them opportunities to even acquire the necessary skills and experience. So we have argued even in the past that where there are acting positions, you cannot say where there's underrepresentation of women, you exclude them for such. App appoint those that are eligible so that they can assume managerial experience so that once such positions are now available, you can target the, the, the pool that you will have created as an organization. So we'll be watching that closely to see from, from the ones that have been appointed for acting, when there's, there are senior positions available, how are those um, is then upward mobility for those, especially those who are suitably qualified. The, the college also clarified, uh, as we say, they said they only had three cases, turns out there were more, and they were able to clarify that uh, the, the outcome of those that included dismissals and some they were not found guilty. But again, this is what we are saying, it's not enough. When, when somebody lodges a complaint or a grievance of sexual harassment, and there's an outcome that says this person is not guilty. What kicks in thereafter to the employer is that you must do that risk assessment. And that risk assessment is the one that the Waterbeck TV did, wherein they said, well, let us go out and find information. Who is at risk and what kind of risk and what can we do? So we challenge the, the Southwest College here to do likewise. Don't just say we don't have cases or they're not being reported enough and then you fold your arms. Proactively act as an organization because you need a deliberate effort as an employer to deal with the current scourge of gender-based violence, including sexual harassment within the workplace. 
Interestingly, it was submitted that uh, they had an employment equity committee that was established on our members in 2016. But there were never there were no meetings. There were no minutes from 2016 until they appeared before us. No minutes were issues were discussed and what 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 actions were taken around those issues. So again, it, it, it becomes that ticking box that for compliance purposes, we'll establish this committee, but we are not going to do anything. So that is one of the things that gave us a, a serious concern when the, the, the entity appeared before us. So what we conclude with this institution is that the, this, it is abundantly clear that the college at top management, it, is, it remains male dominated and the progression of persons with disabilities and women at top management uh, must be prioritized because currently there's a huge gap um, at the college. And we, we have noted the acting positions of uh, females at uh, various campuses to act as managers. We welcome that because it will assist in them accumulating the necessary experience and skills. And um, again, we'll, we'll assess uh, as, as we go into as in other processes to see what is the impact of that? Um, because you cannot just appoint people and then and if they are suitably qualified, you still overlook them for, 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 for assuming leadership position. Um, in conclusion, the overall conclusion is that the, the colleges, um, when we look at from 2020 up until uh, 2022, have demonstrated a commitment to comply with the recommendations of the Commission for Gender Equality. However, the challenge seems to be that most are not able to comply because the projects cannot be fulfilled without the Department of Higher Education and Training. Most of the colleges have conducted workshops and campaigns around the discourse to create an enabling environment for both students and staff members, particularly on the issue of gender-based violence. Some colleges, if you've heard, do not have separate sexual harassment policies. They do not have, they do not hold sexual harassment workshops and they, they rely on the disciplinary code for public servants resolution one of 2003 or have sexual harassment policies in a draft format. The appointment of persons with disabilities and women at various occupational levels continues to be a challenge across all the colleges. As the CG will continue to discharge our constitutional mandate to engage the colleges to ensure full compliance with the recommendations. Uh, that will be the end of my presentation. I'll hand over to you back, Chair. Thank you. I think uh, at this juncture, we will hand over to the chair of the portfolio committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, for that presentation. Thank you so much to all colleagues um, from the different entities that have presented to us this morning for your presentations. I think a lot of research goes into you know, putting this, these reports together um, to utilize also as guides uh, to steer the work that we ought to do in terms of ensuring inclusivity in these different spaces. Can I, okay, that's fine. I think I've managed on my side. Okay, can I acknowledge um, hands from members who would like to engage, but maybe afford, uh, Didi Jiswane, there we go, she's still on the platform. Um, Didi Jiswane, and then from, uh, from DHET, I saw some colleagues uh, coming into the platform uh, earlier on, but I don't know who, who's representing the delegation from, from DHET this morning, if there are any colleagues from there, but let me take, did it, I see also, Dijim Dracha, your device is on the platform, but I'm not sure, are, are you here with us? If you're here with us, DG, please, please just uh, a few remarks from yourself, if there's anything you would like to say. We had received an apology, but it seems like you may have been able to join us at a later stage. Thanks, Chair. I think I'll hand, I'll hand over to DDG as well. And I've been in and out. Um, I picked up the presentation by Neki, uh, picked up the one with uh, Asaf, 
Um, uh, so I think I've been in and out, um, but I think you, you got a sense of the efforts that uh, I think we are trying to put in place not enough and the extent of the challenge. But did you choose one? You've been part of the entire proceedings. Thanks. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, uh, honorable members. Uh, we are just saying uh, you've seen the presentations, Chair. Uh, we acknowledge also the presentation from the Gender Commission in terms of the things that we still need to do, both as the DSI, uh, also working with DHET as our partner department. Uh, we are intentional, especially around the issues of uh, employment equity at this moment, uh, concentrating on that, but we, we do acknowledge what has been said and we'll also wait for the comments and the questions from the uh, honorable, honorable members. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, and Draha. Um, did you one? Can I see if any if there's anyone from DHET? I see DJ Bobo is on the platform. Okay. All right, we'll skip DHET for now. Um colleagues, as we note hands from members. Um, but I also want to acknowledge the presence of Honorable Masigo from the Portfolio Committee on Women, Youth and Persons with Disability. Um, and then, yeah, I think there are other names that I'm not familiar with, but maybe these are some colleagues who are from other, um, other entities, maybe with delegations from entities. But I see with a hand Aruna, I don't know if this is Aruna from the department or if it's a member. Aruna, can I take your hand first before I continue? Okay, the device called Aruna, your hand is up. Can I note who uh, that is? Yeah, okay, I'm on. Sorry. Um, okay, Aruna Singh. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, honorable member. Somebody from your your office or somewhere there was calling me, so I'm trying to manage two things. Uh, thank you very much, um, honorable member. Um, I thought Ms. Mbobo was going to come in, and therefore I was unable to um, come in on time, and that is what my hand up. Um, honorable member, thank you to the um, CGE for the presentations that they made, very detailed uh, presentations on the four colleagues. They are most uh, welcome. And for the side of the deed, I think um, in many instances, the um, uh, presentations were strong in, in making the analysis of um, the college's approach to many of the gender issues. Um, um, are of paramount importance. Uh, rather than responding, you know, to each one, the colleges um, and the issues or challenges or concerns that raised, what is important is um, that whilst we uh, provide policy, it's true, the colleges are right, overarching policy uh, is provided by the DH in certain areas. They, um, especially we try to equalize implementation between the university sector and, and the TV sector, such as on gender equality and, you know, things, distance learning and, you know, RPL and the whole eco environment. Uh, but we do, and this is an important part, it is a requirement that um, colleges domesticate policies through the uh, college councils and we live in through the academic boards. So as much as we provide policy, um, the, you know, this is national policy and it is not specific to institutions. We do expect that and the approval of policy has to happen in the institution. Um, Ms. Singh, can I ask that you switch off your camera because we're losing you from time to time. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. 
All right. So it is important that the college has documented uh, policy um, around um, uh, uh, all of its gender issues. Um, and we'll, we'll certainly exercise oversight um, uh, uh, to ensure that they do that and not just dismiss it as a competency they inherit from the national department. In terms of the student and staff dichotomy, on the student side, of course, gender-based violence is the big thing. And together with higher health, there have been several interventions um, and um, we, you know, we have been tracking that, collecting data and so forth. And as much as uh, it is still a concern, but I do believe compared to where we were five years ago when this was uh, not an issue that was foregrounded in the institutions, we have come a long way. Where now at least there's, um, there, there's some level of reporting. It might not be complete, it might not be in its entirety, but uh, there is um, uh, reporting. It might not be accurate as well, but it has started. Um, in that regard. Uh, overall, beyond you know, the, the gender-based violence and the, 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 the unhappy situation around the gender issues, I must say overall in the TVET colleges, what we've noticed and the data speaks to that, we have higher enrollments of, of female students over male students, and it has been consistent for a, for a great number of years. Our success rates, also reflect higher success amongst female students uh, over the male students. And um, the mechanisms to um, ensure some kind of drive to enrolling more female students in the, in the historically predominant male occupations and programs, we are seeing those shifts uh, such as, you know, simply put in the engineering programs, a number of uh, female students is growing. So I think those are the, are the plus points we can speak to. A lot was, was said about the um, uh, staff profile and, and the lack of transformation and the, um, you know, still having very male dominated um, uh, senior managers. That is true. Um, at the departmental level, we certainly try to um, uh, enforce that transformation through the positions that uh, we oversee. Um, I don't know whether it's common knowledge, but the department is drives the appointment of principals and deputy principals in the colleges. But um, all positions below um, deputy principal are the responsibility of management and council. But even then, I thought Ms. Mbobo would be here and she can testify, we provide them with a profile of the, of the college um, management and staff in terms of gender. And where there are you know, uh, stark imbalances or just imbalances in every appointment that is made at, at any level, there is the need to look at the equity um, uh, ratio, and uh, that has to be taken into account when final decisions are taken on making appointments. So I can say from the side of the department, that is a crucial factor for us, and, and it is on the table. It is part of our uh, complete recruitment process up to the point that we make you know, recommendations for appointment of, of um, middle and senior managers. Um, and, the, and as I said, our corporate services tracks the same data for the appointments made by, uh, college, uh, by the college council and, and management as an internal process. Chair, I don't want to go into too many of the other details. I would rather that the honorable members be afforded an opportunity to ask us questions so we can respond more appropriately and directly to what is of uh, real concern. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Singh. So thank you very much to colleagues from uh, both departments for those inputs. But um, as you say, let's get inputs from members and then we'll get your concluding remarks towards the end of the meeting. Um, I think for me, uh, as I note, the hands of honorable, uh, if you can just switch your opinion. Um, if we note the, if, sorry, as I note the hands of Honorable Mananiso, Makesi, Sibia, Litsie, uh, Masigo, 
Uh, okay. What 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 I think I see, honourable members, um, is a continuation of the engagements we were having um, in KZN when we were with the colleagues from Rocketry, um, in terms of the concern on um, I don't know. I guess what we would what we would want to maybe uh, refer to as the succession journey of, of a student in the science, a, a woman student in the sciences. So um, I don't know if colleagues would remember when we were dealing with the entity that, the, well, not entity, but the, the project on rocketry. Um, they were telling us that the reason why they don't have a lot of representation of young women is because they don't stay, you know, so young women uh, don't necessarily follow through their journey um, on in mechanical engineering uh, up until a point that they can still be part of or they are still found to be part of such um, projects like, you know, like rocketry. So um, I think when you look at the, 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 the data that Naki gave us, um, there is a correlation in terms of that. So, I mean, if you even think of the engagements we had at DUT, um, the first workshop we went through, I went to Shanaz, you'll help me remember what's, what the, the, the name of that workshop was. But even there, um, there was actually absolutely no representation of, of, of women. And I mean, uh, I, it didn't sit well with me personally how those colleagues accounted for it because uh, they, they, to be honest, didn't seem bothered by the fact that, uh, well, not that they didn't seem bothered, but for them it was sort of, it is what it is. The young women are not taking up um, the, the science, engineering, and mathematics uh, degrees or qualifications that, re that are required for what we do here. And so, yeah, that's why you're not seeing young women uh, and not sort of feeling coming across as, as apologetic. And that's and we can't expect, you know, people who benefit from male privilege to be apologetic about representation. And that is why it's always so important for us to be um, intentional about our targets and setting targets to say, OK, in a in 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 uh, X. Um, uh, uh, discipline under science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, we currently have this amount of women, and our target is this. And you know, therefore, we need to be deliberate, even in our career expos, even in our science engagements, in order for us to see that change. And I think, I mean, for us as members, just coming out of our oversight and knowing where the specific needs are, um, mechatronics, um, mechanical engineering, we know now that we need to go out there and, um, and advocate for more young women to come into those specific fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And I think that's also very important in how we have science engagement. And this also goes to what um, Asaf was saying they're doing around the pro uh, programs and, and awards that could incentivize incentivize young women to get into that space is that we, we need to be we can't be too broad. So we can't say we want to have young women in science, technology, and you know, engineering and mathematics. We, we need to say we need young women to take up on these disciplines because this is where we have a shortfall. Uh, this is where we have a shortfall. So I think even in our science engagement, we need to um, be uh, intentionally measured so that um, we can see the outcomes of, um, of, of that engagement in the enrollment numbers in the graduations. Um, and then I just wanted to, to I know colleagues haven't, so, haven't really, colleagues from NACI were saying they haven't really um, dissected the data, so or given meaning to the data. But I, it was interesting to see that some of the other races have declined in terms of enrollment when you look at 20, 2009 to 2022. Because ultimately our understanding is that um, Inclusion doesn't that is, is not exclusion. So where are those where are those numbers going? Where are those where are those students going? Are they studying abroad? Are they leaving South Africa? Are they not studying? So I think that it would be interesting to find out why those those enrollments are declining. So because each group should should increase with with access to education. So each racial group should be increasing. And we've seen, of course, um, great uh, uh, increase um, in, in terms of black students 
and their enrollment in the sciences from 2009 to 2020. But that, the decline is, is, is quite interesting in some of the other racial groups. Um, yeah, I think we it's very clear from the stats that we've been given that the engineering enrollments are still the lowest compared to, for example, social sciences. And that is something that we need to work on coming right through from basic education into higher education. And then that speaks, of course, to strengthening the availability and accessibility of those particular subjects in basic education. Um, and then, of course, I think we must notice a concern uh, as, a, as a committee, the fact that we still have male academics um, uh, dominant in terms of our uh, compilation or makeup of our academics. And then um, one would want to, looking at the slides from ASAF, it would be interesting to make a study as to why Argentina, Russia, and Portugal um, are, are quite, there is some sort of gender equity in terms of the authors there. Um, when you look at slide three, you know, they, they're doing quite well in terms of having a balance there. So it would be interesting in terms, uh, it would be interesting to find out what they're doing differently for them to have uh, the balance that they have in terms of their authors. Um, and then I think we must acknowledge the increase in enrollments of women in masters and PhD uh, qualifications. And it would be good to know whether or not that correlates to the increased funding or the intent, increased in intentional funding towards uh, black women uh, ultimately attaining their PhDs as per the targets of the Department of Science and Innovation. So it would be great to see whether or not uh, those increases are matched to the to the deliberacy of funding for, for um, women in, in, in to, co to continue with their masters and PhDs. And then of course, uh, acknowledging the work around incentivizing women in science. And um, with CGE, I'll come back a bit later, but also to appreciate the, the sentiment that, well, one, I think uh, Irina um, Singh, of course, you've committed to the fact that you will take the recommendations from the CGE as a department and use them in the work that you, you ought to do as a department in strengthening the capacity of TBIT colleges to be inclusive through uh, reviewing their, their policies, ensuring that there are policies um, in place, you know, and, and, and any other recommendation that speaks to uh, the gender inclusivity of our TVET colleges. So one that, that, that is, yeah, the department must acknowledge what the CGE is recommending and implement it. But two, um, I want to appreciate the sentiment that um, was communicated by colleagues on the institutions that have not that, that have not yet had rape cases or, or GBV cases or sexual harassment cases, um, making a risk analysis um, to ensure that it, it doesn't happen. And, and I think that's the kind of proactive leadership that we want to see. And so I just wanted to, to acknowledge that. Honorable Mananiso. Thank you, Chairperson. And uh, good day, colleagues on the platform. Uh, let me start by welcoming all the presentations. And one must indicate, Chairperson, that I am partly covered on the issues that you have raised with regards to the report of Nikki and uh, Asaf. Because during our oversight, we, we have learned to say it is important perhaps to promote the STEM program from a primary level of schooling. So I, I think uh, their presentation actually indicates that we still have a lot of work to do in terms of ensuring that we lobby and advocate that people must understand that it is important to have uh, medicine science as subject at that particular level. And I think Honorable Machesi has been more on that to say, you know what, the problem that we see in this particular level, it's on the basis that uh, young people are not encouraged to do medicine science. So it is important that we note that. And uh, Chairperson, I'm just happy by the fact that their, their presentation actually, uh, it is transparent in a sense that 
it it reflects the realities on their space to say in terms of the work that we are anticipating them to do on the gender transformation agenda they are doing little however there's appetite of doing more so what we need to do as the portfolio committee is to ensure that uh, we keep on you know monitoring them consistently in ensuring that they stick to you know the 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 the, the goal that you want to achieve in terms of the transformational agenda and uh, mine would be for the department. Uh, I think, Chairperson, today we need to take a stance with regards to the department on the, the, the transformational agenda to say it is important that they must see to it that all these institutions, they have a policy uh, in place and as well they implement those particular policies because uh, for me, we would speak more on CGE, but fact is, if they, had, they don't, you know, do what they have to do in ensuring that there's uniformity in all these institutions, we're going to be dealing with this agenda, agenda problem as, by the way. So I, I, I think I want to say to the to DHET, it is important that from now on, they give us a specific time frame in terms of when will all these institutions have uh, policies in place with regards to a uh, gender transformation agenda. That's what I want to, to, to say to the to say from today, they must give us specific time frames because now it's as if we'll be dealing with piece and bits of institutions with regards to one thing. I mean, I, I'm worried where I'm sitting that uh, you have institutions that does, doesn't have employment equity policy. I, I, how are these particular institutions operating in from a point of recruiting people and actually just operational administrative issues within the institution with regards to uh, the development of the institution? So it, it's very problematic. So it is important that uh, they must note uh, this particular concern. And uh, Chair, now I'm going to CGE. Uh, I'm, I'm, I want to be understood in a sense that uh, nobody thinks that I think that uh, CGE doesn't work. I'm, I'm very worried about uh, the presentation from CGE about noting that there's lack of non-compliance on issues of policies. Most of the programs that are being done, it's ticking box programs and it, there's too much of lack of this, lack of this, lack of this. So I, I think it's worrisome. And uh, I, I, I believe that maybe this institution, they don't take CGE serious. And perhaps maybe CGE, they are not even enforcing uh, 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 the, the, the response in terms of their recommendations. So I, I can, can CGE submit to us in writing as a, this particular portfolio committee with regards to their recommendation and program of action for monitoring and evaluation. Because perhaps it's, be, it's because of their monitoring and evaluation is very, you know, lenient on what is happening. So can they just share with us so that we, we check in terms of what is it that actually CGE is doing to ensure that they monitor and evaluate? Because here we're dealing with repetitive offenders who think that gender agenda is just a by the way thing it doesn't feature on the development agenda of this particular country so it must be corrected and i believe where i'm at people who are at the core phase of actually uh, dealing with this problem is cge and chairperson i i think one would want to just suggest to cge to say perhaps they need to With uh, entities in terms of the best uh, strategies in other institutions with a gender chair, chairperson. Uh, chairperson. On, on my side, the network is a bit weak. Um, if you could maybe switch off the camera. All right, no problem. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it looks better. Also, it's on orange now. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, where should I start? You didn't miss much. So just... Uh, uh, all right. Yeah. All right. 
So I just wanted to share as well with CGE to, to say perhaps they need to share the uh, best models in terms of what is it that, that you speak about when you say we need a focal person who will deal with gender agenda. Uh, why I'm raising this chairperson is because of across the country, we don't have one uh, uniformed approach in terms of what is it that we want to see that particular person do or that particular institution doing in that particular unit. So it is important that they, they, they actually share with other institutions to say, well, you know, when we speak about a gender, a focal person, this is what we want. That particular person must do one, two, three. And that particular person must focus on policies like one, one ABC. So it is important that with them as well, when they do this monetary and evaluation, they are able to share best practice in terms of what other people are doing to deal with the gender agenda inclusively so. Uh, I think I would just end there. However, I'm happy that they are committed in terms of ensuring that they train all these institutions on issues of gender-based violence and femicide. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Mananiso. Honorable Machesi. Thank you, Chair. I won't switch on my, my camera, uh, if that's okay with you. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, yes, yeah, almost 12 midday. Um, you know, I just want to thank uh, uh, the pre presenters and also um, the different uh, stakeholders that presented for, for their um, presentations. You know, uh, Chair, my issue, as you know, is, you know, this um, when it comes to not only women being represented in science, but uh, generally uh, finding our young people as well to be to be part of, um, of, of science, to do science. And I always believe that uh, it's supposed to start right at the bottom, which is uh, in, in our basic education. I know that um, Nessie mentioned that, you know, they are having collaborations with, um, with um, basic education. But uh, what I saw from Nasi was just uh, statistics. I would have really liked to see how are they uh, impacting and what role are they making sure are they playing to make sure that um, that their mandate, because their mandate is to ensure that students do like uh, end up uh, doing science. Um, there was from um, from Asaf, I could see that there was a bit of, uh, from their side, they're more proactive in that sense, like, you know, they are trying to, to have more platforms and, and, and even to go to as far as uh, to incentivize um, students that end up in science. But I didn't have that feeling with NASI because all I could hear was just uh, the statistics that are out there, which is, you know, statistics that we all know and we are very much aware of. Uh, so I would like to really find out what is it that they're doing, how proactive they are, because this is a problem. Um, we we cannot have, you know, a, a, an entity that is primarily there to make sure that students uh, end up in the science fraternity and we are doing, we are really like, we are dismal when it comes to this. Uh, we, I mean, our statistics are showing. I know that uh, it was referred several times that uh, these are issues like it's also happening globally. I think for once in South Africa, why can't we lead in that, uh, in that sector? Why can't we ensure that like, you know, we have the right type of teachers at schools because that's, that's where it starts, you know, to make, making sure that, you know, there is an interest for, from our own students who can, um, we can actually take an interest because everyone thinks that maths, maths and science is too difficult. It's just not bothered to, to, to take in, to make an effort to, 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 to include the math and science as, as, as their subjects. And therefore, if you have that kind of um, attitude coming from basic education or, um, and eventually that will basically lead to students not having um, uh, science, not getting into science because they don't have math and science. So the, the root cause, uh, I think it, it has to be dealt with. It has to be right at the bottom. What are we doing to ensure that we have teachers that are trained, that are adequately trained, that they're able to, um, to teach math and science? 
because it's like uh, you have countries like uh, in Russia that, that I think because of the fact that like the math is uh, is uh, obligatory, that, that means like, you know, um, everybody is, is obliged to do math. Therefore, you're gonna eventually you're gonna see different uh, statistics coming from them. But in our case, because we have math lit, uh, so that means like you know students are just uh, gonna go for math lit because they think that that's much easier. Um, you know they they don't have to do any math, so they've got that option. But wh what is it that uh, these entities are ensuring are doing to ensure that like at least the type of teachers that we have, we cannot have like a majority of teachers that are studying at universities that are doing, you know, other subjects like languages and history and all that and coming back to your school. Uh, but we are not really calculating a, a culture of, of having more teachers to teach in, uh, in science and, and math. I think, I think more needs to be done. I'm, I just feel like I'm, I'm a bit um, uh, disappointed because it looks like there's really no, no concrete plan of how we're going to be able to achieve this, it's uh, it's, it's kind of like okay, yes, it's a, by the way, it, it, you know, we're trying to do our best, but but I don't see like a concrete um, effort to say how are we going to meet our targets, how are we going to ensure that like you know the targets are met, and what is it that we are doing now, and why is not working, and what other means or ways that we can utilize to ensure that we 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 really. Um, you know, try to achieve uh, our, 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 the mandate, even, you know, uh, uh, exceed even wh whatever the, 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 the targets that, that are needed. So I've, I feel like, you know, these entities, they have to do more. I'm sorry, I've, uh, that, that, that's my feeling. Uh, when it comes to CG, CGE, A, the issue of uh, gender-based violence is, is a problem. Uh, the other day I went to um, a court here in, um, a woman's court here in Bluffenton. I, I went to do oversight there. And there were women that were getting protection orders. Like for instance, you get a protection order today because you left uh, wherever that was like, you know, attacking you at home and you are there to get a protection order. But when you leave, they'll tell you, no, come back the following day. They'll say like, you'll come back tomorrow, but you need a protection order to be available and and be able to have it with you so that you can go and present it to a person, your perpetrator at home. So we are basically like um, indirectly putting women in, in danger because if we are unable to provide the services that they require when they require and when they've been um, you know, attacked in their own homes or you know, even family members or whatever. And I just feel like you know, CGE needs to do more. Um, you know, the, 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 the existence of CGE has been there for a very long time. When you have a situation like that whereby uh, women, the, the reason why they couldn't print, the, the, they couldn't give the women the, the protection order is because the printers were not working in the court. The printer was not, so they had to go somewhere else and to, to basically, you know, uh, ensure that they're printing and, this, and, and these women had to come back the following day. What are the chances of that woman coming back? Uh, the following day, if he's gonna go to the same house with the same man that uh, that that beat him up the previous day, that is abusing him, uh, abusing her, that you know, so she's basically sent back to the same same environment again to be to be attacked. Uh, so I think I, I don't know. I just feel like you know, there's. I mean, I've I've, I've worked the CGE, and uh, I feel like you know, there's. There isn't much. I know that the problems that they have is the budget. You know, they don't have enough budget. But uh, you know, when you are in a court like that, you need to be able to have some kind of a call center as well where you can complain about this. I've, I just didn't have a feeling that, like, you know, there is there is a um, a, a working relationship with CGEs. Like, I feel like CGE is there, and the courts are, you know, are on the are, other side and you know really not really being part of it because I asked the women that were there that like you know do you know about CGE and they were like no we don't know um, CGE how to contact them when we have problems and all that so I think the CGE has to be more more vocal it has to be out there and women should be and because like we have a, 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 a pandemic uh, gender-based violence is a pandemic in this country 
And I just feel like, you know, there isn't, um, the voice of CGE is not heard. It's just not, you know, out there for, for women to be able to, to know that like, you know, they are available and they can be able to assist with, with information that the women need. Um, so the chair, I mean, I don't have a question for CGE, but like, I just feel like uh, they need to be heard. Their voices need to be heard. We need to be, they have to be on our face as women. One is, one, they must be basically on our face. We're talking about gender-based violence, but like, you know, CGE also must be, must be part of, 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 they are part of the dialogue, but I just feel like their voice is not, is not out there for women to, to hear what they're doing. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Marquesi. I'm seeing a lot of comments in the chat. So essentially, honorable members, honorable members and colleagues, um, committees online run like a they run like a like a committee meeting. So if you're commenting on the side on the chat, it's like you're speaking while others are speaking. So I'd like to just uh, encourage us to rather wait for when your respective entities will respond to us. If there's more that you would like to contribute, um, you can do so in writing if those who represent you have not covered all of that of which you'd like to add. So I'd like to just um, encourage us not to be too busy on the chat because it's like we're speaking while others are speaking. Thank you. I'd like to then ask Honorable Sibia to give her inputs. Uh, at the time, Chairperson, allow me to switch off my video because of connectivity challenge. Uh, thanks for all the presentations. Um, on CGE, uh, what capacity does the does the CGE expect TVET colleges to have to reduce to have to to have to deal uh, with GBV of the campus as recommended to Angala TVET College, and the other one. What is that uh, ideal capacity for a TVET college to deal with GPV and do most colleges have this capacity? Why does South Africa College have a low compliance with recommendations? And uh, We'd like to recommend that the Southwest College develops an implementation plan for responding to CGE recommendations and submit it to the portfolio. Mam Sibia, I was trying to hold and on. Another recommendation: the department uh, also should set and uh, finalize and adopt policies within 2023. Hello. Hello. Sorry, we had lost you. The network was quite Do you bad. hear me? Well, the network was quite bad. Perhaps let's okay. give you a moment. We'll come back to you. Okay, thanks, Ma. Thank you. Honorable sure. <clears throat> it's one minute past 12. Good day, um, everybody. Um, and um, let's welcome the presentations from all entities. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's welcome all presentations from all entities, um, greet everybody on the platform, honorable members, uh, councils of uh, entities and management of those entities. Um, 
I think maybe let's start with the um, CGE chair. Um, in the last presentation they did to us, they had informed us that um, um, the Northern Cape Tibet uh, had failed to appear before them. And in fact, that college had sent them a letter through a lawyer. Uh, I think it was on the 18th of November, 2021. They sent them a letter through a lawyer that they won't be able to appear. They wanted a postponement. CGE uh, um, responded to them and informed them that um, they, they can um, grant them the postponement, postponement provided they appear on the 19th uh, and they did not appear on the 19th. The CGE then reported to us that um, they were in the process of, of uh, laying criminal charges against um, this college. Uh, did that uh, happen? Um, if not, why did it not happen? Um, and how far did they go as far as uh, uh, that is concerned? Um, I'm asking this because in the presentation, uh, it appears that somehow they found each other. Um, um, because they're part of the four uh, colleges that, um, that were um, interviewed um, on this. <clears throat> and I want to ask them, um, what is their view on um, um, the extent of uh, the GBV statistics across uh, all Tibet? I know that they did say that some, uh, or was it Southwest College that said no cases, but they found few cases and all of that. But what is the view on the extent of GBV statistics across uh, all colleges? And um, which colleges have a relatively high prevalence of GBV? And do they, do they believe that these colleges have the adequate capacity to deal with GBV? Um, um, and then, um, <clears throat> and I think we was um, trying to make a recommendation to DHET on this, uh, that um, uh, DHET should ensure that uh, the college, Southwest uh, College, develop uh, an implementation plan uh, for responding to CGE recommendation. And this, uh, they should submit it uh, to us uh, within three months from today. Um, I also want to suggest that DHET uh, must set up a, a roadmap where they'll get to uh, day zero of um, Tivet colleges to finalize and adopt sexual harassment policies. And it should be this year. <clears throat> and um, there's my other question somewhere here. I want to just get it quickly. Okay, maybe let me go to Nike and Nasaf. And I want to ask them, the first question is, have they looked at um, the cost of 
STEM related programs at universities. Uh, because that might be the single most common reason why we have a, a low number of students uh, in that uh, STEM related programs compared to social sciences and humanities. Um, I'm saying this chair because even though government has put up around 50 billion, 51 billion actually this year to fund student, students at higher institutions, uh, not everybody is funded through NSFAS. Some are self-funded. And uh, because of the high cost of these uh, STEM-related programs, it might be difficult for some students to choose those. So I wanted to ask them if they've uh, looked at uh, the cost of, of, of the STEM related programs and have they engaged, if they have uh, looked at the, uh, the cost, have they engaged the department um, of higher education so that internal the higher education, um, department of higher education through their university branch can then engage USAF and universities in terms of uh, regulating the STEM related programs so that they can be accessible to, um, to many, to many uh, people who may not necessarily afford. Uh, to Naki, um, our postgraduate Postgraduate enrollment has not grown beyond the 18%. And we have sufficient high, uh, high education capacity, I mean, human resource, student finding, and institutional capacity to increase this percentage. And, and factors, what factors uh, contribute to a low percentage of males? in the postgraduate diploma level and postgraduate bachelor level, uh, which is sharply skewed uh, to females. Um, and African researchers are not significantly increasing. While scholars and Indians are constant, according to um, the stats, what has led to sharp increase of other races uh, from uh, 2015? What investment in women can shift the professor statistics? And how long can the gap um, be filled under existing supporting mechanism that you have currently? And on funding allocation, the presentation does not have funding aspects, which are critical to analyze the distribution of, foreign, of funds from race, class, and gender perspective. And on scientific ratings, NRF rated researchers have a significant gap for historically disadvantaged institutions. And what is the impact of the current programs as accelerators to support these HDI uh, researchers? And my recommendations to, to Nike, I think they must submit a funding allocation distribution along racial class and gender lenses. Uh, Nike to advocate for financial support for female innovators and innovation mainstreaming in the state. Nike should advocate for more professor pipeline programs focusing on women in STEM. Must to Nike to prioritize advice on improving STEM enrollment in our basic education system. To Asaf, um, I saw uh, a colleague from NASAF there on the chat even mentioning uh, this matter of Argentina, uh, that Argentina and Russia have a relatively equitable distribution of gender and science. What has enabled uh, these countries to have an equitable gender distribution and what lessons can we learn uh, from these countries? OWSDSA is an important initiative but there's lack of focus on supporting schools and promoting sciences and math 
as the problem is at the base, which is basic education enrollment. Um, and what is the focused, impactful approach ASAF is, is implementing to encourage learners and schools to register to take STEM route as the stat statistics in basic, uh, basic education are indeed uh, very concerning. And recommendations there is that to ASAF to focus on, on the promotion of math skills within the first 10 years of a child. It should ensure its partnership and programs as a significant focus on ba basic education and changing the national narrative on maths and science by parents and learners, as this will increase female participation. And lastly, ASAF should advocate more uh, uh, professor pipeline pro uh, programs focusing on women in um, in STEM. And I think, Chair, we must also ask uh, ASAF uh, to consider going into partnership with uh, basic education. Basic education in provinces, Chair, they've got uh, uh, STEM institutions. And how they, I think it's called Saibono. Uh, in Pumalanga, uh, I can't remember the exact name, but each province has a, a dedicated uh, institution or institute that deals with um, with um, with STEM programs. Uh, I know in Pumalanga because I serve in the basic education committee as well. When we're doing oversight there, we we visited it. And uh, they they have in the whole province they've got 101 schools that are STEM schools um, where they do uh, tutoring to te to teachers who are teaching math and science in FET phase from grade 10 to 12, where on Saturdays uh, remotely they they to these 101 schools they conduct classes um, to these schools. Uh, these learners attend uh, between uh, grade 10 and 12. Um, and maybe ASAF should consider going into partnership with them so that uh, ASAF can train the trainers, can concentrate on assisting provinces in better equipping math, science, uh, technology, and uh, all, all related uh, STEM programs or teachers, uh, better equipping them to uh, better uh, deliver their education uh, or the content of the education to these learners. So I, I want to recommend that they, they, they consider that, uh, that um, uh, 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 um, suggestion that I'm giving them, because I think uh, we will not have chair. In fact, last year, the beginning of 2021, uh, the higher education department did not reach its target of enrolling enough, I think it was 66,000 something learners or students across the country because there were not enough students who were studying, who were doing math, 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 mathematics in 2021. Uh, who passed math and science with 60% or more, because that is the, the minimum that is required for you to enter in this program. So if we don't put in a, an effort in making sure that uh, the throughput rate from basic education is enough, uh, will not have enough enrolling in this, and then will not have enough throughput rate or graduates coming out of STEM programs. So uh, higher education uh, department itself and its entities cannot sit back, hold arms and say, no, it's because we're not getting enough students into the system of higher education. Uh, um, the higher education um, department itself and the uh, the entities must ensure that there's uh, enough uh, pipeline students coming into this STEM and uh, hence some, 
suggesting that they do that with uh, collab with collaborations with the basic education so that we have enough uh, uh, coming in. Um, um, I think I've labored the point uh, enough, uh, Chair. Thank you very much um, for the opportunity. Thank you, Honorable Litier. Honorable Masigo. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson, and uh, good day to your good self, Honorable Members, and all the colleagues on the platform. Chair, one must firstly appreciate the opportunity for the Portfolio Committee for Women, Youth, and Persons with uh, Disabilities uh, to be invited and contribute and participate um, in the three presentations, which we must welcome. They, they have been uh, quite informative, Chairperson, but I, I think the most important thing is that a challenge um, has been raised to us as members of parliament to ensure that we are part and parcel of the transformation agenda in higher education. Um, as we all know, Chairperson, that uh, generally the trans transformation agenda in, in South Africa needs a shift to the higher gear. More especially, Chairperson, you know, one one has been in, um, in 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 the tertiary institution space in the early uh, 2000s. Uh, uh, comrade, uh, sorry, Honourable uh, Letia will 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 agree to us that we have been speaking about the issue of transformation, and uh, and I'm sure, Chairperson, even in your era. Uh, when you enrolled as well in the in the tertiary institution space, you had spoken about issues of transformation in higher education. And um, um, I was speaking to my chairperson who has requested that we apologize for her. She's also, she was enrolling for her honors uh, of which last year she was start doing her honors degree in vets. And uh, she, she, she was telling me also that, you know, the issue of transformation, especially a, 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 in dealing with the equitable um, a gender distribution is quite important. So, Chairperson, it's 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 very um, for me. Um, I, I've been covered by most of the honourable members, um, so my comments will just be general in nature and say that Chairperson, but what is important is that we must as as um, as we enter into frank discussions, be able to define the roles and responsibilities of all the stakeholders. It's not going to assist us if we would uh, pick up one and say that CGE must do one, two, three, four, five. All of us have roles and responsibilities that we need to play, especially in relation to monitoring and evaluation. We do understand that some of our chapter nine institutions um, do not have the necessary resources in terms of human resources as well as the financial capacity to monitor and evaluate each and every institution that we are having in this country. So there's a role that also parliament can play. There's a bigger role that the Department of Higher Education uh, 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 must play in relation to ensuring that all the institutions are in compliance. Um, there was even a talk of a, a saying that because sometimes we must not shy away from the fact that some of these institutions we would like to pa pass the back to the Department of Higher Education, but we do understand that there must be some form of um, a, 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 the domestic a, the domestication, as they had said, of the policies. So there's no excuse, uh, Honorable Chairperson, that some institution would not be having sexual harassment policies. And it's not for the, the, the CGE to remind them continuously that uh, you haven't complied, you must be having a, a, a sexual harassment policy within your institution. We can't be at this uh, at time and, 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 and era say that some institutions are, are having um, a non-existence um, or some are even in the draft phase two to three years after the investigation has taken place. Um, there must be some form of accountability. So the one question that one would have to CGE, because we do understand that they, they and appreciate the fact that they have gone back to, to, to the institutions that they've conducted the investigations on. Um, 
on whether or not they have been able to engage the Department of Higher Education because it comes up repetitively so that um, some of the institutions have noted the fact that um, they, they uh, are able to do much, but the um, more or, or maybe other things are lying within the responsibilities of uh, the Department of Higher Education as well as the Department of Labor. So the engagement with those two departments is quite important, um, obviously having lifted some of the issues from the, 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 the institutions that, um, or the TVET colleges that they have visited. So Honorable Chairperson, um, it's important for them to, to, to say that, but also, um, I know that um, Honorable Lizier had picked up on the fact of um, the, 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 the professors because we cannot be having an Irish coffee type of a situation. Uh, and also, you know that in churches, you will have a situation where most of the church goers are women, uh, but also uh, you'll then find that the pastors are male. So in terms of the, the, the professorship um, a, a representation, I think more investment needs to be made, but we also then need to get as to what then becomes the investment that has been made in the female cohorts um, so that they are able to, to, or maybe we can be able to even see a shift um, in the states that we are currently seeing in terms of the professors. And uh, also then how long can the gap be filled under existing support mechanisms that have been created to ensure that there is a shift that, um, that, that, that we are seeing. Uh, but honorable chairperson, I think I'm covered by most, uh, but only to, to then say that we need to strengthen now, not only say that, e -E -E, because we need to be realistic in terms of what CGE can do and what CGE cannot do. So for me, as much as CGE needs to go back and ensure that there is some form of equitable gender distribution that takes place, but we, we also need to ensure that the monitoring role of the Department of Higher Education as it relates to compliance and accountability of the institutions takes place. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Masigo. Thank you very much to all honorable members for their comments, questions, and recommendations. Mam Sibia, can I come back to you? Um, I don't know if you had concluded there were some um, uh, network challenges earlier on. Okay, I think we're fine. All right, at this point, I, I would want to hand over back to, to colleagues, but um, I think it would be important just noting what Honorable Masigo was saying in terms of uh, appreciating the fact that we all have different responsibilities to play. That's why it was very important for us to get an understanding on in my opening remarks, whether or not we strengthened the relations between the Department of Higher Education as well as the CGE, because you would remember Honorable Masigo in the past, in the previous meeting we had um, the CGE on the question Honorable Litsier asked on the Northern Cape uh, Urban Tibet College, where they were not um, uh, being cooperative in terms of the work that the, that the CGE wanted to do. You, you would remember that we, we even said that the it's, 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 it's unacceptable that we have a situation where, um, you know, the CGE and the department are not in conversation where there was, uh, where it was said that um, they, the, the department was interacting with the report for the first time and, and, and. So we said, no, com colleagues, you need to strengthen your, your working relations because there's a part where the CGE must then hand over the responsibilities of implementation and execution to the department. And so we also need to get an update, even stemming from the TVET um, uh, Industry Partnership Summit where on day two, um, Singh Didi uh, Jimbop, or you'd remember that we said, um, we took the recommendations that came from the CGE on uh, gender related matters um, in the TVET sector. And we said that those are 
recommendations that we need to take and 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 work on. We're not even we're not at differing with what the CGE has recommended and ours is to implement those recommendations and assist in ensuring that those colleges that uh, th that these recommendations find expression in the various colleges. And from coming from this update, I think personally, uh, it would be important colleagues from what everyone has said that the department responds to us through the TVET uh, program on what it has done to ensure that the recommendations of the CGE have found expression. So I, I, I would like to put that as a recommendation going forth that in the next seven days, we need to get a written um, uh, reports from the Department of Higher Education and Training on progress made since the, you know, the last engagement we had with the, the CGE in relation to these colleges and the overarching recommendations that the CGE would have given us in relation to the TVET program. And then um, in terms of the NACI data, it would be important that this data be put into meaning. And I don't know what the future of that looks like. So the data is very important. And I think many of us appreciate it, not only as DHET, but also as DSI. And I think that both the DHET and, the, and DSI need to, take, need to take the NACI data into consideration when we go into planning. Um, I think that this the type of data that has been put before, before us could really assist us in our planning. Um, so those are the three recommendations that I think are coming from my side. Um, let me at this point hand over to colleagues from, we'll start with Naki, then we'll go to Asaf if there's any closing remarks from your side. Uh, and then we'll go to the CGE and then wrap it up with the, the two colleagues representing the department. Um, so let me hand over to colleagues from Naki. Is it on? Thank you, um, Honorable Mkachwa, for um, a great summary of the uh, and the recommendations that you have put forward, especially for our entity. I am just going to give a comment based on what you have put forward uh, to us. In terms of the data that we have presented today, um, um, Honorable Chairperson and members, please note that we were presenting it as, as a, dis a descriptive part of our study because we are saying this is the current situation, this is what is existing. The methodology that we used to collect that data was based on the existing data from the higher education management information system, which is giving us an indication of the issues or of the trends that are currently existing in higher education in terms of women participation in science, um, uh, technology and innovation. Um, just on the other comment that you put forward, Honorable Chairperson, in terms of the decline in the number of enrollments for other racial groups, we have noted the comment. In fact, as you were talking together with the other members of the portfolio committee with their comments and questions and feedback, we were noting it because it's actually part of the second phase of our study that we are going to do to complement the um, uh, data that we obtained uh, from, from HEMI so that then we are able to explain or come up with the implications of the data so that we are able then to put um, um, recommendations that will sort of provide evidence uh, that could be used uh, to advise the minister in terms of how the gaps that are identified could be um, addressed. So we are greatly appreciative of that. Um, as we were preparing for this meeting, our, our, our approach or our view was that we are coming to committee members so that we can also get their input that will assist us to uh, make sure that the study is um, comprehensive or broad enough. So this is part of the engagement or consultation that we are also doing so that we make sure that all aspects are addressed. Um, just another uh, part in terms of um, um, addressing the enrollment plans. Um, this is based on my observation as an academia in one of the institutions of higher education. We um, are aware of the issues that are currently evolving 
And one of the things that we are looking at to try now and interrogate at a deeper level and using a wider population target is to actually see, um, 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 make sure that the data that we collect is gonna assist uh, in terms of formulating the targets that should be set for the ideal overall postgraduate enrollment share in the public university system. So in doing so, our, our intention is to provide the advisory services at a national level so that an equitable proportion of enrollment could then uh, be done um, for um, 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 uh, students that are enrolled in postgraduate programs, especially those where in those in instances where we see the decline in the enrollment. So we are grateful for for that. And also, if we can um, indicate that we are also uh, mindful of the um, um, uh, current systems that are existing or processes that we need to interrogate. Uh, for example, the DH University enrollment planning process, which now, which we also need to um, interrogate and see if uh, the data that we are going to collect as the second phase of the of the project um, that will also inform um, them in terms of maybe doing some modifications if need be. Um, so we um, hope that with all of the the further data that will be collected will then be able or will be in a better position to put flesh into the skeleton that you are providing today and be able to advise the committee members on the recommendations that will address the gap. Um, in terms of the other um, comments that we received from Honorable Nomsa in terms of the role of NACI um, um, to make sure that we um, um, assist uh, the sector in addressing the gaps that are currently existing. We have noted the comments um, and the questions that were raised, but then we also um, want to just emphasize that as NACI, our role is to provide um, evidence-informed advice to the minister and through the minister, the minister's committee, interministerial committees, and other relevant or key stakeholders on the role and contribution of science, technology, and, inno and innovation, um, so that then um, the national objectives uh, could be enhanced or promoted. So we are mindful of that. We have noted it, and we'll do accordingly from our side. In terms of the um, comments and questions that were raised by Honorable Leti, uh, we really um, um, are grateful for those comments because they are also assisting us in um, shaping the data collection instruments that we're going to use going forward. Um, in particular, the cost of STEM related causes um, adversities to enhance the accessibility um, for, 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 for women um, enrollments. Uh, this is one variable or factor that we are now going to cater in the data collection tool so that we can interrogate the factors around that and be able to report and then advise or put evidence-based uh, recommendations that will be able to inform the relevant sectors so that the issue could be addressed. And we also welcome the comment that was raised regarding the student funding. We um, um, are aware as NACI and also based on my observation as a NACI council member, but who is involved in academia, that student funding for postgraduate uh, studies is a challenge and it also needs to be enhanced so that um, high achieving students could be attracted or recruited into the program and they could um, continue with their doctoral and postgraduate uh, or postdoctoral programs into the academy. Um, um, this is based on the premise that um, we all know that postgraduate pipeline serves as the main pathway for securing a career in academia. So um, if we go with that notion, it's going to assist us in even addressing the other issues that we have seen in the data that we provided in terms of the representation of the different academic ranks um, of women um, um, in academia so that the problem could be addressed at the root cause or at the main source. 
Um, that also goes, um, um, the same goes for the NRF rating and the research outputs and the funding for further studies that needs to be done. So in short, um, um, Honorable Chairperson and, and, and committee members, we are saying we acknowledge and welcome all the recommendations and questions and input that we've received today. It will really help us going forward so that we could then um, um, address the main issues that will really um, um, assist us as NACI in providing evidence to the minister on the best practices that will inform um, um, the strategies um, going forward uh, to promote the representation and full participation of women in science, technology and innovation. Thank you from my side. Thank you very much, colleagues. Mr. Tella, you've been very quiet in today's meeting. Are you fine? <laughs> well, we love to hear your, your voice. <laughs> uh, uh, council member, Mam Zoom, we, we love to hear your voice. Kotwa, I'm just checking there on, on the CEO, what's all right now? No, no, I'm fine, I'm, I'm fine, Che. Um, I think uh, Professor Zoom has covered um, um all the issues because really as she emphasized uh, building on your real recommendation to uh, to for us to add value to the study and then enhance its utility um tendogazi agreed as honorable members were raising issues uh, that we need to really address the why question um, and and then begin to make sure that the scope um, is expanded um, so that the advice that will then come out of the study um, will really be helpful um, in improving the issues that that are being uh, suggested. The, maybe just the last point, Che, um, for other members as well to to appreciate that uh, we our interest in math and and, and science. And, and engineering is, is why. That's why we, we also completed the study uh, looking at basic education, you know, uh, focusing on the extent to which the various programs that are meant to improve the performance of maths and science. Uh, and we've, you know, we've done that study um, with recommendations uh, involved a range of stakeholders. Part of that report, it talks to what can be done with respect to improving teaching or teacher training. Uh, it also talks to curriculum issues. So, so this work that we are doing, it's building on a portfolio uh, of work that we are seeking to, to use to contribute towards finding solutions in, in our country in improving the educational system uh, across different levels. We are really grateful the chairperson for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof Zungu and Mr. Kele and to the entire team at NACI for that. It would be great. I don't know if you, you know, in terms of industry um, and just seeing the, um, I don't know, following the enrollment, you know, till, till industry. So not only academically in terms of professorship and academic staff, but just in terms of the industries that we want to contribute to the development of, to the sustainable development of our country, responding to the economic reconstruction and recovery plan of the president, responding to many of the issues that president spoke to and that were debated during the SONA around infrastructure. It would be interesting to even our cities and how we want to see our metros and our cities developing. It would be interesting to see if we have, I don't know, just getting the data, pushing it a bit far like pushing it a bit further. I don't know how much further we can go. Of course, it, it's, it's like Honorable Masigo was saying, reminding all of us that we all have different responsibilities. I'm not trying to push you out of your scope, but um, it, would be, it would be great to see how far we can go in terms of that. Thank you so much, colleagues. Um, then I'd like to hand over to colleagues um, from ASAF. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, Chairperson Makwacha. I'm going to give a few high-level remarks as the representative of the ASIF Council, and then I will hand over to our CEO, uh, Professor uh, Himla Sudeal, to give more of the detail. 
So let me start by saying that that SF has the SF Council has um, approved the SF transformation strategy, which is uh, geared towards addressing the disparities not only in gender but also in disciplinary, geographical, and the type of institution HDI historically disadvantaged versus historically advantaged universities. And we are in the implementation phase or developing a strategy for implementation of that. So we we really take the fact that we don't have adequate gender representation really seriously. The second thing is that we have a, a standing committee, which is called the STEMI committee, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and, and innovation. And a lot of what the recommendations that were made here today will be referred to them to really think, unpack, and give effect to all of the good ideas that were given here today. I want to pick up on two themes that came up from the honorable members of the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee. The first very prominent one that was, message, that was uh, mentioned by yourself, uh, Honorable Chairperson, but also uh, Honorable Letzi, Masiko, and Marchesi was building the pipeline. And building the pipeline from basic education right up through to the university professorships and how to ensure that we do this in a coordinated way working with all the relevant people and all of the stakeholders and doing this together as opposed to independently and in silos. And the idea of, of looking at the impact of um, deliberate funding is really important as well. And the second, the second thing that, that sort of uh, resonated with a number of you uh, was the lessons that we learned from other countries. So why, for example, was Argentina and Russia and Portugal, I believe, doing better in terms of the gender parity when it came to authorship. And certainly, this is something that we could take forward as ASAF and perhaps through our STEMI committee to look into in terms of what are the lessons that we can learn from there. So with those few high-level remarks, I'd like to hand over to Professor Sudia to take uh, on more of this. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Professor Isak, and thank you for raising the two themes. We hadn't conferred on this, but you kind of hit the nail on the head with respect to what I was going to build on. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and to members for uh, the constructive comments and criticisms. I couldn't agree more that we need to first understand that pipeline from primary education to secondary education, tertiary education, and then into the main fold of academic work. Um, because, Chairperson, you may recall that whenever we meet with this committee, we get asked about the membership uh, complement. And as we've seen from the presentation by our colleagues from NACI, the pipeline is not very well sustained. Um, why is it that we have the gender discrepancy? Why is it that we have the racial discrepancy? Why do we have the discrepancies with respect to the publications, et cetera, et cetera? These are rampant and alive in our uh, national landscape at present. And yes, we should all be working together to try to address it. But this is what comes out of the pipeline when ASAF seeks a nomination for members into the academy. But that's not the issue that I want to plug for now, but just to acknowledge that uh, the, the situation, the lived experience of the situation is built in the data that we've just heard today, which I believe everybody has acknowledged. Then the second part uh, that is important is how can we as the academy be much more productive? Chairperson, we have engaged with the basic education, in particular, the life sciences uh, division. I um, have presented to, uh, by invitation from the life sciences sector, to representatives from all the provinces in life sciences. As some of you may know, my personal research background is in the field of human genetics, as particularly applied to human history, origins, and evolution. And I've been fortunate that I've had the opportunities to use this space to build on the sector of how we can promote science, how we can make science exciting, et cetera. And some of my colleagues in paleontology, like the likes of Lee Berger and the people at the Origin Center at Wits University, among other sites on the, uh, in uh, South Africa, have contributed 
to plugging the visibility of just this theme of science. Uh, so, so we are fortunate that we have that. And we have engaged them also with respect to the Quest magazine, which is a magazine that uh, Asaf puts out on a quarterly basis. And in that magazine, we try to cover issues on curriculum. We inspire the, the scholars by bringing to them uh, issues of relevance that are topical in sciences internationally and locally. And, and, and we have various means of trying to build a reach to connect with uh, scholars in the, the last two to three years of school, plus uh, early undergraduate people, and of course the general public on issues pertaining to science. And this is a work in progress. Yes, we have a new um, program officer uh, within the secretariat and he's come with some exciting ideas on how we can do better, including uh, language, putting out, uh, you know, some of our articles in multiple local languages. So that's also a work in progress. ASAF contributes annually in the National Science uh, Festival uh, with National Science Week. Um, and uh, we try to work in collaboration with SASTA that when we host certain uh, meetings of interest that, that with them, we bring out uh, some schools to attend these presentations. And we try to engage our speakers to be able to, to monitor the, the content so that it becomes accessible to the early or the young scholars attending. Thank you, uh, Honorable Letsi, for highlighting the issue regarding um, uh, Cybono, et cetera. Uh, Chairperson, just last week, I gave a presentation at the Johannesburg Cybono in a series that they are hosting is a hosting called, you know, Engage with a Scientist. And there must have been, there were two schools with over 200 young learners from grade 11 in attendance. And again, it was an awesome, awesome experience to be able to engage with them and hear them ask questions from a scientist. So, so we participate in this and, and we are in the process of trying to establish an MOU with the various uh, science centers in the Houting area. In addition to this, we plan outreach programs and we're going to start with Limpopo province with the University of Limpopo and UNIVEN and some of the science centers in that region. Because again, we believe that this is an underrepresented region where we as ASAP had had a footprint. And so we are going to try to focus our immediate attention in those areas where we do not have too many members, plus build the bandwidth for our young academy and early career scientists. You have heard from Dr. Malusi on some of the activities that we are doing, and we hope to continue with this. Other activities uh, for visibility of the nature of of more stakeholder engagement is the ASAF Presidential Roundtable that's hosted by the ASAF President. And Chairperson, we've, we've had many, many talks on the advancement of science, uh, education, and techno technology interventions in school. And in fact, next week on the 22nd, we're going to have a very interesting talk on the GP chat that's now very topical uh, and seeing how that assessment is all taking place. With regards to the, few, for, uh, the, the, the visibility of future professors, I am also pleased to announce that from the work done by Professor Jonathan Janssen um, and in partnership with DHET, we have in place a very, very successful future professors program. They now have the third cohort that's just come into place. And the first two cohorts have been hosted by Stellenbosch University and University of Johannesburg respectively. I have played a significant role in both of these initiatives. And in fact, on the 10th of March, I'm giving the uh, plenary at the new uh, meeting of, of the new cohort. Why I raise it here is, boy, you have to sit in the presence of these young scientists. And when you listen to what they are doing and what they are bringing into our national landscape, it, you, you will have to be in awe. These young prof, uh, scholars who are like, you know, senior professors and some of them associate professors, 
are really, really the future of this country. They know their content, they publish internationally, they have a high quality of their scientific vigor, they participate in postgraduate training, and they have a significant outreach. While they're doing all of this, they are also being tutored and mentored to be able to take their current standing into full professorship. And with that, I am sure their international reputation and what they would eventually contribute to this country going forward is going to be noted. And Chairperson, if ever you have an opportunity for some space, it would be incredible for this committee to engage with the, with the organizers of this program. So you could see from their perspective, how this is contributing to the advancement and development of future professors in this country. Chair, we have heard also that the country is investing a significant amount from the fiscus, something in the order of 51 billion uh, in the NASPERS program. And it is also with sadness that in the same note, I note that there are over 700,000 graduates who have applied for the 350 rand subsidy that the president announced in his SONA speech. Why is that? Whose responsibility is it to ensure that our graduates have a niche for employment? I believe that this is an urgent question that, re that requires intensive debate, as I am sure uh, you in parliament are having those discussions. So from a science perspective, while uh, you know, the, the infrastructure of generating scholarship and academic scholarship in particular in the country is ripe to the, to the tune that we have over 700,000 graduates walking the streets without employment that they have to apply for the subsidy is really, really a sad time in our country's journey. Uh, Chair, um, there's uh, also already been comments made about the, the discrepancy in, in numbers of scholars across the na uh, international grid. I guess it's something we have to uh, work towards and I will just uh, see if Dr. Pule is still on board, uh, if she wanted to add a few comments. Um, Caroline, would you like to respond? Caroline, uh, if you can unmute and respond if you wanted to. Ah, sorry, Chair, I don't want to take up time. She may be. She did have another urgent engagement. So I think Professor Isak has covered that. My so, apologies. Ah, Prof, my apologies. Go. My mute button was not going through. Apologies. Okay. Um, okay. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to say um, thank you first for this opportunity to respond. Uh, but I also believe um, uh, uh, most of what I wanted to say was said already by uh, Prof or Dr. Sabiha. Uh, on her respond, but I also take the recommendation. It's a it's a very good one. I mean, looking at the graphics, you could definitely see that there is a discrepancy between the different countries. So the ideal thing would be to go back to that study and try to see uh, what um, key roles that they were they were doing, or like some of the ways to see what how they were doing their studies in order to see how what can we learn from them. And I do. Um, Thank you for the recommendations uh, that was that was made by both the the chair, the honourable chair, and also one of the council members. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, Chairperson, that's as much as I would like to say. But before I go off, I'd like to say that uh, when we last met, you asked us for some written comments, etc., which we did supply uh, through to the secretariat. But once again, I wish to extend an invitation to you and the committee to engage with us further beyond these formal meetings, because I do believe that when we meet, uh, um, we can have very constructive engagements. We all are fighting the same battle. And so long as we can speak with the same voice, I'm sure we would show support to the president for the initiatives he's trying to do. Uh, with that, I uh, hand over back to you, Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof. 
studio, as well as to the entire team at ASAF. Definitely we'll take up on your request for us to interact beyond this platform. Uh, Shanaz, please remind me every time we're struggling with uh, certain data and information, let's, let's not forget to reach out to our colleagues um, at ASAF, at Naki, uh, to assist us in processing um, some of the issues that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis that they, must, that, that they may also interact with at times. So thank you very much for, for that reminder, Prof. Sudial. Um, and thank you to the entire team at ASAF. I'd like to then um, hand over to colleagues from the CGE chair, and then you will, you will hand over to the CEO. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and the honorable members. And for this uh, interaction, we appreciate the comments made by the portfolio committee members, especially that uh, we, we are, want to echo the, our respect and thankfulness to uh, Honorable Masiko. We felt as if we've got somebody from home who is accompanying us and who, could, who understands our issues as CTE. But I would like to emphasize to the point that biggest uh, constant of CTE is that it is only allows us for a number of issues. And it, our recommendation are not binding. We, we just make recommendations that will bind only if we, came, we take the, the CGE uh, act where we, what we want it to be interacted. And we, we think that we need the support of the portfolio uh, committees that the CGE uh, mandate, the CGE act to be reviewed by doing that, we will find that the act will give us more power and more interaction so that when we say we do, we have these recommendations, we should, it should not be weakened. We should be bounded by our CTE act. With these few weeks, I want to hand over to the, C, to the CEO and the legal uh, HOD, which is Dennis. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Chair. I think the sentiments that uh, the Chair has expressed are so appropriate um, that we're not able to really, you know, use the, the current regime of regulation in an effective way to deal with gender justice issues across society with the limitations of um, uh, non-binding recommendations. And we'd really like portfolio committee to even parliament to support us when we come with a formal proposal to, to parliament for that. I think the, the substantial parts of the questions that were raised by the portfolio call members, um, Dr. Teres Matoto will deal with it because he has a, you know, an, a, his, you know historical information that the committee was, was asking. But just on, on one or two things, just to say that I think the first one, we welcome the request by the portfolio committee to share around the best practices because with the municipalities, we've actually established what we call gender focal points. And in fact, as we speak now, our research team is traveling around the country making an assessment of the effectiveness or effectiveness of the gender focal points within the heart of it. We would really want them to actually ensure that there's a gendered um, integrated development plans within the municipalities. And certainly we'll borrow some of you know, that experience and really see if and customize it to make sure that it actually speaks to the institutions of uh, um, high learning. So would really um, share that with the portfolio. But also the second issue for me, which is coming up quite strongly in the, in the report that we're presenting was the issue around the, the, the numerical goals and what I call political statement of institutions in relation to their commitment on gender equity, and that it's not translated fully into, into actual ensuring that they get to honor and execute their commitments. And the next round of our you know, um, investigation is really going to be upscaling and even in looking at what we call harmful inclusion of uh, you know, women in 
leadership position without applying gender equity principles, but applying gender equality principle. And what makes it harmful is that more often is that women get parachuted into position of power without the institutions investing sufficiently in supporting them so that they are quite effective in undertaking their work. And probably if we appear to the committee in the next 18 to 24 months, we'll be able to share some of the insights because I think that's quite important around how do we um, how do we engender equity but also support women's leadership into position of, position of power within the institutions of high learning. With that, Chair and, and Portfolio Committee members and colleagues, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Tonis Matutora to deal with the substantial parts of the questions. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, thank, thank you so much, CEO. Um, I think I'm, I'm covered a bit, but I'll just go straight with the, the first one. Um, my chairperson and the CEO have expressed the, my views also here. But just to also indicate one area that we must acknowledge in South Africa, that the, the bulk of transformation uh, tools or empowering provisions in the country are based on soft law. Therefore, you, you will struggle to, to have a, a, a program of action that you can even enforce at court because by its very nature, it's, it's based on soft law. And even if you look at, at different countries, whether it's, it's Jamaica from, from Norway, Norway tried to, to come up with um, at least a quota system um, and, and I think in Rwanda as well to, to come up with a quota system that can ensure that there's enforceability of, of, of targets at the end of the day. Currently in South Africa, we don't have that. So you even have a, the, the Employment Equity Act that is very much clear that a quota system cannot, um, cannot be, uh, is not permissible in law. So that is a limitation on its own. So part of our challenge is that the transformation agenda in South Africa is based on soft law. And the, the honorable member from the Portfolio Committee of Women and Persons with Disability correctly stated that, and I share the sentiments that the transformation agenda needs to shift to a higher gear because in this current format and with this current system that is here in South Africa, there's a lot of limitations that, that, that are there. And it may just create a view that issues of gender and gender equity as a whole are not prioritized. So from, from my understanding as the CG also is that we, we must appreciate that we are operating on a soft law and not hard law. And we have to use, unfortunately, a carrot approach to try to persuade entities to comply with some of the recommendations that we have as an institution. And there's another question around the, the best models to say the, the CGE should be providing the best practices. Um, honorable member, one of the, the objectives also coming out of our hearings is to precisely do that, to share the best practices in terms of, 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 of transformation from different angles. The honorable member makes reference to the gender focal point and, and one of the things that we have said in our reports year in, year out, was that you cannot have a gender focal person or an employment equity manager at a lower, at a lower position. Because what it does happen is that they are unable to influence decision makers because they, of the position that they occupy. So part of the, the best practices that we were able to even recommend was that firstly, the, 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 there must be even a KPA for a gender focal person or an employment equity manager. It must be clear, the KPA must be clear, and there must be consequence management for failure to achieve certain targets or aspirations, but also appoint that person at a senior level and deal with an array of policies that the CGs are available to share with. Equally, we, we've seen the challenges that women experience in, in leadership positions, and that, that includes this uh, unrewarded work as, as, as mothers and so forth. And we're able to draw inspiration from some of our entities that appeared before us that held um, childcare facilities. That is why in our reports, we are very much um, advocating for workplaces to develop and come up with childcare facilities to allow women to balance their private life as well as their work life. So those are some of the, the best practices because we're able to see from those that appeared that they were able to retain women in leadership positions, primarily because of all these 
um, measures that are there that says your interest within this organization remains a priority. Your, your other work that is not rewarded, it's a priority to the institution. So breast, breastfeeding facilities are in there. They breastfeed twice a day. Um, they even have a, a, somebody who looks after the children when they're busy attending to work. That is the best measure that we said we are recommending to other institutions because it's able to cater for those needs and interests of, of often the previously uh, disadvantaged groups. The, 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 this is not a question, but an ex a concern uh, that we also share around the, the protection orders that um, women are not able to get expeditiously um, because of infrastructure failure. Sometimes it's not even infrastructure failure, it's, it's the backlog that is there around court cases at court. Um, at times, it's about the lack of understanding by those who are tasked to implement the law. Um, at, at times, it's, it's, it's circumstances that one cannot even comprehend. That is load shading. One would say, uh, because of load shading, I'm unable to print. You know? So there are an array of challenges that are there within the justice cluster that impedes issues around gender, uh, I mean, uh, among justice as a whole, because what it does do is that it undermines that responsibility and right that everyone enjoys. But what we do as the CG Honorable Member is that notwithstanding our limitation as an organization in terms of personnel, there are cases that we initiate on our own accord where we do go to court and, and, and ensure that we deal with these issues that are brought to our attention. In some instances, we use our communications department also to try to get the message across about the relevance and the visibility of the CG, what it can and what it cannot do. We try to do our best and our communications department is doing excellently in that regard. Perhaps it has not reached all community members the way we would want to, but within the constraints that we have, we are committed to ensure that issues that undermine justice for women and children in this country are addressed. The, the issues around the Nkangala, what capacity does, uh, does the, the, the institution have the appropriate capacity to deal with gender-based violence? Um, the answer is no, honorable member. And the reason is the, the achievement of, of a society that is free from all forms of oppression requires a concerted effort by all key role players. That includes the, C, the CGE, that includes SAPS, that includes social development and even parliament. So what we have recommended as the CGE to capacitate the, 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 co the college was that collaborate with South African police service, right? Get security personnel, come up with innovative measures in line with your own unique circumstances and see how we can deal with gender-based violence. And that is the, the reason why on their own accord, they were able to say this app, this, this app will be appropriate under the circumstances. But we are saying that should not be the only one. Collaborate with hospitals and, and ensure that those who are subjected to gender-based violence are able to get psychosocial support from the nearest hospital. So that's what they're doing. They're collaborating with various hospitals and clinics to, for counseling purposes. They are collaborating with the South African Police Service because honorable members, it requires a concerted effort. It cannot be the Nkangala problem alone. They cannot achieve it. It cannot be the CGE alone. It is impossible to achieve. We need all these collaborative efforts from all role players to ensure that we, we fight the scourge that is taking away lives of, of vulnerable groups in society. The, there is a question around um, what happened with the, the, the Northern Cape. So if, if, if we're to go back, um, and I think the honorable member from the Portfolio Committee of Women also touched a bit on that. We, we held a meeting with the Department of Higher Education and Training prior to our engagement to, to, to with the portfolio, this Portfolio Committee last year. And what we have highlighted in our first meeting, in fact, it was three different meetings, we called the Department of Higher Education first as a respondent to account before the commission around the measures that they have put in place to, to address the challenges that T 
TVET colleges and universities broadly experience. And we shared those recommendations and they committed to deal with that. When it came to TVET colleges, we dealt with the, the challenges relating to uh, KwaZulu Natal, KZ, I mean, Coastal KZ and TVET, Talezo, Moteo, and Lovedale. Again, we, we, we then saw, thought as the CG that the issues that are coming from the TVET sector are quite peculiar when you compare them to the universities. Because with the universities, they were able to develop their own policies. They were able to come up with their own measures and implement the recommendations without a challenge, at least to, 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 to our satisfaction. But of course, there are still challenges that are there. What was peculiar about the TVET colleges and why we sought a meeting with TVET, I mean, with the, with the higher education was that they, we were able to, to identify that we cannot move with the TVETs because firstly, they don't even understand the, 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 the purpose of our engagement. There is lack of, uh, of appreciation of its importance and their understanding was that they cannot partake in any process unless it is given a thumbs up by the Department of Higher Education. So we 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 sought this this analogy. We said, okay, but then what it requires, even if we go to the second set of TVET colleges, we're going to experience this. Honourable members, you you may recall in our presentation that we specifically made reference to uh, Taletsu, um as, as one of the TVET colleges that said to us their hands are very much tight. They cannot provide security. They don't have budget. They don't have resources to implement any of the recommendations delivered by the CGE, right? So for, it was from that premise that we said, okay, then we need to now engage the Department of Higher Education. Now we held a meeting, uh, the meeting that was held with the portfolio committee, the Department of Higher Education correctly highlighted that the, the there were concerns around the, the CGE report not being shared and, and, and they are not privy to that content. But the, the, the reality, honorable members, is that the basis of our meeting with the Department of Higher Education stems from the, from the previous meeting that we shared. And we agreed from that point that even the subsequent TVET colleges that we'll deal with, all the challenges should find expression around the measures that the TV, the, 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 DHET, the, the DHET is putting in place to address the overall challenges that are coming with the, with the sector. Because what we're able to agree was that the issues within the colleges, they are all common. So to, 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 to deal with one entity and neglect the mother institution being the DHET will defeat the whole purpose. So a plea was made to say, but the CGE, you cannot therefore deal with Northern Cape in the manner that you are doing without engaging the DHET. It is from that premise therefore that we're saying, well, let us see the progress that the DHET can do to implement the overall challenges that they themselves acknowledge around the, the TVET sector. So we've allowed that process to be included with Dalezo, Muteo, and KZN um, TVET College and Lovedale that is in the Eastern Cape. So we trust that that process, the DHET will be able to come back and say, they, the, to deal with the overall challenges, this is the plan. And they have done so in, in other areas already. They've given us a, a policy framework that they are going to recommend that it be implemented in all Tibet colleges. And we welcome that and we said that is a measure that uh, you can put forward. Therefore, it will mean even next time when we go to other Tibet colleges, we should be expecting those to be in place. So it is how we dealt with the Northern Cape matter ultimately. The, the question was raised around the GBV statistics, um, around the Tibet colleges across the country. And a follow-up there for us also, which, which college or TVET had the highest statistic in that regard? Um, honorable members, we have done only eight TVET colleges in our processes because of the, the resource limitations. Um, we are not in a position to, to confidently indicate where, how are the statistics across all TVET, um, the, the statistics are around the TVET across the country. What we have done is was only around the eight that we dealt with. And then from, from the eight, again, the issue was around the, the, the rapes that are taking place on campus. It was again around 
sexual harassment that was coming on. But what we, we were able to unearth in the process was that then we, we had other TVET colleges that were reporting similar issues. It is from that angle again that we said to the DHET, it will be important that we can have unified guidelines that deals with gender-based violence across all institutions. So to sum it up, honorable members, I will say the CG doesn't have um, an answer as to which college uh, has the most reported gender-based violence in the country. We do not have that because we only dealt with the ones that we have sampled and we only sampled only, only eight. Um, I think I've touched all of them. If I'm if omitted something, I'll, that will be guided. Thank you, Chairperson. CEO, would you like to come in, Chair? Would you like to come in before I take over? No, uh, uh, Chair, I think we've answered the questions. I don't know if maybe any of the commissioners would want to make uh, some additions. All right, I think we're fine. All right. Yeah. Let's then hand over to um, the colleagues from DDG's one. Can I hand over to you? And then back to Ms. Singh. Th th thank you, Chair. I would like to hand over to Ms. Ashley Rest because I have to run Chair to another agent meeting that just started, but I've uh, briefed her in terms of her response, but she's also very, very well versed on the subject matter. Thank you very much, Chair. Ashley? Uh you are on mute. Uh, okay, Good. Um, thank you, DG Gizani, and thank you, honoured members and colleagues. I just wanted to uh, make one or two points. I think this session and the information that we received here today was very useful, as always. Um, and um, one of the issues that I think uh, some of the members have raised, and that is also at the forefront of our mind at the DSI, is that we've got a number of, of initiatives being undertaken by different um, entities within the national system of innovation and the country. And so uh, we are working at the DSI towards trying to make sure that we have better coordination and so that we don't duplicate issues and that we can also weigh necessary pool funding so we can our, our can have greater impact from some of our initiatives and also i think the importance that has been raised in terms of information to inform policy. So if you look at the, the stats that were made available by the National Advisory Council, and I know through ISAF we also tap into global statistics and so on, to make sure that all of those are available to people that might want to use them, and also to make sure that in all of our efforts around gender, particularly uh, within the National system of innovation, we build a reflective component, an M&E component into that work, um, where that data is also going to be um, useful to us. So I just with those couple of points, I just wanted to say, thank you very much. Uh, we found this very helpful. And we will engage with colleagues afterwards, and just study the presentations that were made in more detail. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Ms. Rust. All right, let me then hand over to uh, Ms. Singh. Uh, thank, thank you, Honorable Chair and members. Um, Chair, I've, I've tried to extract as best I can some of the things that emerged from the um, uh, comments and so forth. And um, just um, very briefly, oh, by the way, before I proceed, Chair, uh, Ms. Mbobo had a message to say that she unfortunately couldn't uh, attend because she was uh, about to board a flight at that time when the um, session had started. So please do um, uh, record her apologies that, 
that she had sent through me, if that is acceptable. Uh, Chair, in terms of the, um, um, uh, the review of the gender policies at colleges, we take that seriously and it will be uh, something we will follow up on through the department um, to check that they have it in the first place and to review them for currency and so forth and also take uh, into um, account uh, the um, recommendation that we set a deadline for colleges to um, adopt a, a GBV, GBV uh, policy for the institution at the institutional level. So those are two key things that um, I would take away from here. Another key thing, and I do think it's important to share this with the honorable members and the entities, uh, with regard to the capacity at uh, TVET colleges to actually deal with the issues of um, uh, gender-based violence and uh, in general, the, the, the gender issues. It was indicated that um, uh, you know, the, the DP, Deputy Principal Corporate, has uh, this element incorporated into his or her job description at the college as corporate services. It actually is very much the same in the department. It, it falls under corporate services. And uh, you know, given, given the, the uh, nature of TVET colleges, as you can well imagine, in the, in the corporate services portfolio, which is extremely vast, something like GBV is not going to be um, an absolute priority. It is recognized as important, extremely important, but they just aren't the foot soldiers there to engage in the manner that is necessary. So that is unfortunately the case. Um, and even with the review of the college structure, you know, we, we are in a process of looking at um, new organograms for both the department and for the colleges. Uh, having a dedicated person in a portfolio like this um, does not look like a reality for the foreseeable future. But in the meantime, what we, we are doing is working very closely with higher health and they are, they are uh, an extremely valuable resource. And they do have a presence in the colleges across the, the, you know, the national footprint. So with higher health and largely what the colleges use is a referral system. So they obviously don't have support system, professional services and so forth within the college, but they use a referral system. And uh, our colleges, um, uh, so sometimes to a greater extent than universities, are multi-campus uh, institutions. So that makes it a lot more difficult to administer and to have a presence uh, to support um, the, the GBV um, uh, cases, for example, at every campus. So this is where a higher health kicks in and the referral system. Um, uh, helps. Some colleges have done this very well and they have a, a very good and strong referral system, mainly the colleges in the Western Cape, I would say, and even Mateo College. Mateo College, just to share, had won an international award for its student support services. It was uh, two years ago. Um, and it was independently evaluated. So the referral system does work. And uh, what we have to do is work hard at getting all colleges to use the referral system in the absence of having dedicated services on site. What is difficult though, is that many of these cases happen, you know, the, the GBV cases uh, happen outside of campuses. I suppose in many instances, the same with universities. And that is where law enforcement is extremely important because that's what it becomes. It becomes a criminal case. And um, there's total reliance then on the effectiveness of law enforcement in those areas where our students find themselves. And sometimes that is not always the case. But the colleges um, uh, in general, are supportive of the students and try to, uh, you know, uh, pick up the cases and get the cases uh, documented and so forth. But Chair, yeah, I think the reality is always uh, also that when these things happen, such as when students are affected by, by these cases of, of, of um, gender-based violence, even where staff are subjected to, to um, uh, harassment and so forth. When there is intervention of whatever sort, 
it never happens in an ideal environment. Further to, to what has happened, the, the intervention is, is subjected to a great deal of harassment. Um, very often there's, there's threats made against uh, any attempt to investigate and bring, bring the perpetrators to book. And um, that becomes quite a protracted case. And we've seen that happen at different institutions. So I'm just highlighting that, you know, when, when these things happen, it's not a very linear process. There are many other dynamics and very hostile dynamics that often um, come into play because uh, despite the, you know, the, this being a, a, a crime or a criminal situation, just say in the case of GBV, they are always antagonists in the whole scenario that have to be dealt with. And then chair on the issue of NCU, Northern Cape Urban, it was very disappointing to hear what we've heard, the non-cooperation of the college. I, I don't know if that was brought to the attention of the department at the time that um, you know the, the um, engagement happened or the lack of cooperation. We would have certainly liked to have known about it at that time and intervened because that is a role that we, we have to play in a very significant way. And it could have helped if it was brought to our attention at that time. Chair, in terms of implementing the recommendations of the CGE, you've indicated that you would like a report from the department. Um, I just need clarity whether that will come more formally after the session or whether that would be a takeaway for me uh, from this meeting. I thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, colleagues. Um, so just to maybe answer the last question uh, from, from yourself, Dr. S um, or Ms. Singh. Um, so there's a lot, and, and, and Mr. Matutuga, Dr. Dennis, um, spoke a bit also to answer Honorable Lizia's question. Uh, but I think we need to have something more concrete uh, because, I mean, for example, on one element of the observations stemming from the initial investigation, right, in terms of the observations there, on the one issue, there's a, there's a bit of what uh, Dr. Dennis would say, there's a, you're saying, you know, you went away, but I know that um, uh, DDG Zoom was aware of some of the challenges that we had with that institution, because it was coming out of that discussion, that we said, but there needs to be greater synergy between the work that is being done. So there's a lot that colleagues are saying, and I think the best way, in fact, we're not even concerned about the past. We, we want to know if we've been able to resolve the, the challenge, um, which, which the colleagues from CGE have alluded to, to some extent, and we want to, we, we want to be brought into confidence that whatever work the CGE is trying to do in that college, they are able to do in assisting us in addressing um, the gender related issues in our institutions of higher learning. So that's what we want to know. The, who, who did what, when, and yeah, I think we, we can move from there, but are we now, what's most important is are we able to now work together moving forward? So we need to be brought into confidence colleagues by yourselves uh, as the department and the CGE that you are working together on these matters and they aren't the, the, the type of gaps that we were witnessing in the previous discussion that we had. Um, so I think that, and then, yeah, so the report that we are requesting from yourselves is to say, since the CGE briefed the committee and the committee gave this particular recommendation, this is what we have done as DHEAD together with the CGE. And, this is, and then in terms of the actual recommendations um, stemming from the, the investigations of the, of the CGE, this is what we've been able to address so far. Some of them Dr. Dennis has spoken to, but I think we would like for uh, DHEAT to take us through what they've been able to, to address thus far. So I think that's what we're asking for in the next uh, working seven days. All right, and then if I were to then say, uh, you know, really appreciate what um, the responses from colleagues and the engagement that we've had today, um, 
we are hoping that there is an appreciation honorable masigo for us it's not only the, the the our focus is not only on the work of the higher education and training but also the interface between higher education and training and science and innovation because the one feeds into the other so we 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 would skill young people to be able to uh, be active participants within the national system of innovation and beyond that as we appreciate the fact that science and innovation doesn't only exist uh, within the department but it in fact exists within every single department um, in government uh, and that is why for example we're pushing Nike to say if 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 the scope allows you can you even track the numbers going into industry so that um, uh, uh, much of what you know the president has said we should be focusing on in terms of the skills we need to develop our country is the, can we follow it through till the end? So we are, I think, I hope that colleagues from the different um, uh, uh, entities that presented, you've been able to pick up data that can assist you in the different work that you do. We, I, we for one as a committee, I think are seeing, you know, the circle, uh, the cycle come full circle, or whatever that term is, but we're seeing the ecosystem, right? We, it's an ecosystem. If you, if 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 you don't ensure that the institution of higher learning has systems in place to protect the existence of young women in 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 the TVET space, you're not going to have young women who are innovators in science and innovation. You're not going to have young women who can articulate into uh, uh, um, from the TVET program into the university program and therefore change the landscape of your A and P rated scientists. Um, you're not gonna have young women who are able to drive key innovations around engineering and infrastructure development if you don't have them coming through the ranks through a safe uh, institution of higher learning, through uh, deliberate funding for them, through actual actually targeting them to join, to, to take up uh, uh, science, technology, engineering, or mathematics, to follow through uh, in terms of um, from undergrad into post into postgraduate, you know, so to become the the, prof, the the academic staff that we're still seeing as predominantly male. So, so we're seeing the ecosystem come full circle, the role that, you know, the work that as does in terms of science engagement, in terms of incentivizing the, the work that NACI is doing and giving us the stats, the data. This is where we are. So in terms of planning, how do we plan better? CGE, these are the stats that support your findings. So here are the numbers. So if we're not seeing enough women, is it because they're falling through the cracks because we don't have the adequate uh, policies in place, because we don't have systems to protect them, because they're getting uh, raped? And if they, and if it, if it is that if the CGE finds that they are getting raped, then we'll understand why the the, the enrollment num the figures of of the young women vis-a-vis -vis the graduation does not match. So I think it was very important for us colleagues to have all three of these entities coming and presenting to us as one and us trying to and, and giving us a better perspective of where we are trying to go go in terms of meeting the NDP targets and ensuring a more inclusive and intersectional society in order for us to have innovations and science that can respond to the socioeconomic needs of our society. So, so that is the broader picture and I hope we've all been able to learn from one another. There is work that we all need to do. I think from NACI, we've given you a task. There have been tasks that have also been given to ASAF. There are tasks that are given to... Um, to, to the CGE and there are reflections that we need to make as well. Uh, we, we've always said as a committee that we are aware of the financial constraints and even as Dr. Dennis was speaking, the human capacity constraints and he was saying, look, even with our constraints, we need to push ourselves and we are pushing ourselves uh, in, 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 in broadening our area of, of, of investigation in such a manner of our, or our contributions in such a manner. So, so colleagues, we understand the, re, the, the constraints that we have, um, but let us, we, at no point must we do the bare minimum. Uh, let's do as much as we can, but of course we understand the, the constraints that we have. But I also think I want to echo the sentiments of um, of the whip to 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 women, um, youth and persons with disabilities, in such that we need to strengthen the ecosystem. We can't work in silos. So with the limited resources that we have, colleagues, 
So it can't be that, for example, CGE goes and does research that NACI is doing. Just go fetch the data from NACI, you see, so that we, we don't waste resources and time that we don't have. Um, it can't be that there's a some component of DHET that is doing the work that NACI, DHET or DSI that's doing the work that NACI is doing. Go and get the data from uh, Mr. Kele there, no mom's womb. So that is the kind of um, uh, collaboration that we also need to see amongst colleagues so that we can alleviate the pressure from one another and be more effective in the work that we need to do. And that is exactly why as a committee, when we, when, when we, when we saw that this was, uh, you know, what was going to be on the program of the committee, we felt it necessary to reach out to multi-party women's caucus, reach out to the Honorable Lucas who's responsible for, uh, you know, um, uh, what do they call this, these engagements, sectoral, sectoral uh, uh, parliament uh, to reach out to the, 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 the portfolio committee on, on women, youth and persons with disability, on police and on justice. And those colleagues have sent apologies, but we will also share the, the discussions that we've had and the observations coming out of this meeting with those colleagues so that in the work that they do around, um, you know, in justice, the work that they do in policing. I mean, there was a suggestion here, which has been a continuous suggestion of, of the committee with every uh, uh, um, institution of higher learning that we interact with to say, how are your relations with the surrounding police station? Do you have support for, for, um, from them? And that is why CEO Nkomo, we have, uh, uh, in our oversight visits that we just had now, uh, two week long oversight visits where we interacted with over 21 sites, um, we, we, in, we ensured that we brought in um, provincial legislature. So we had members from provincial legislature um, because these institutions exist within communities. So they don't, ex they, they don't exist in isolation to their surrounding communities. And there are issues that are community-based but affect our institutions. And so maybe by bringing in the local leadership, we can strengthen the partnerships between our institutions and the communities they exist within so that we are able to alleviate the pressures of these societal ills that end up inundating our, our institutions. Um, so, so there is also effort from you know, the side of the committee to increase that type of support that you yourselves are also uh, recommending as you do the investigations that you do. Um, uh, with that being said, colleagues, we really want to again appreciate all your your inputs, and I'd like to believe that this then brings us to the end of our meeting. We would just like to have that update from um, from DHET on uh, on 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 how far we've come on our engagements with the CGE, as well as um, uh, update on 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 our implementation of the recommendations from the CGE. Thank you so much, honourable members and colleagues. Have yourselves a lovely Friday and afternoon. Recording Thank stopped. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you, colleagues. Bye. Thank you very much.